We're with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at the OSU Library. Today is Thursday, June 30th, 2011, and we're in Hugo, Oklahoma, entering Luciana Loyal, also known as Lucy, Lucy. a little easier to say, and also Zefta Pertle, but we like to call her Dolly. Does that sound right? That's good. All right. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank We're going to begin with Lucy. Lucy, I'd like you to tell us where you were born, what year, and give me a little bit of background on your parents. Okay. I was born in Sarasota, Florida, 1949, at Sarasota Memorial. And my doctor's name was Dr. Miller, but the pediatrician was Dr. Olson. And... Um, now, my father was born in Milan, Italy. My mother was born in Florence, Italy. My father's name was Alfonso Loyal. My mother's name was Lilia Panini. And uh, my father came to the United States in 1932 with Ringling Brothers Circus. And my mother wasn't from show business. She was, as we call, a towner. And, uh, but her uncle joined the circus, joined a teeterboard act. Um, and somehow or rather, he met my father's sister. And he married my aunt Albertina and uh, he was here in the United States before the war broke out in Europe Second World War and mom of course was in Italy in the war well after the war my uncle would write to my mother or his sister and my mother was his favorite niece in Europe and somehow or other through the writing she sent my uncle or her uncle a picture and my father just happened to see this picture and asked my uncle would he mind if he wrote to her so my father would write my mother and they fell in love through these letters and then in 1948 the family brought my mother over from europe into baltimore and that's how come I'm here. They got married and here I am. <laughs> All right, Dolly, uh, tell me a little bit about where you were born, what year, uh, and then a little bit about your parents. I was born in Chicago, Illinois in 1944 at the Cook County Hospital. My father's name is Raymond Perez. My mother is Zefta Loyal Perez and uh, she came to this country in 1932 with Ringland Brothers. And in fact, Lucy and I are first cousins. Uh, her dad is my mother's brother. There were five other brothers and sisters that were also involved in the circus and we wintered in Sarasota, Florida. And um, my dad's family, they were somewhat circus. They were in it for a little while and then they got out of it. And that's how my mother met my father was with the Ringling Brothers, because uh, they were performing with them also. Uh, I grew up in Sarasota, Florida. I was in the circus, did flying trapeze, did trapeze. And uh, after I got older, I was in Sailor Circus, which was part of the Sarasota High School, because that's where I went to school. Then I met my first husband, and he was from Texas and I ended up moving to Texas. And uh, I got out of the circus and uh, I ended up going into to law enforcement and became a detective and then I married a sheriff. My mother, however, stayed in the circus. She stayed circus until she retired and she always told me, she says, Dolly, I will retire center ring I will never stay long enough to where I'm going to be in a side ring. And that's what she did. 
She retired in 1954, I believe it was, in the center room. And she said, I'm getting on up in age. And she says, I know what's getting ready to happen. And she says, it's not going to happen to me. And she got out of the circus. And she always had that feather in the hat. She always said, that's my feather in the hat. Because I was center ring from the day I went in to the day I retired. And it was really important to her. So she was, she was very, very talented. And how, how old would she have been? She was born in 1916. And I'll let you do the math. Um, Miss 2000 and um, well she okay. retired she retired at 54 oh, okay so what are we looking oh, at there about 16. 20 30 years 30 years something like mm -hmm. that 26 36 46 56 so it was almost been, 50 years or almost 45 years something like that but mm -hmm. um, yeah she just made the point that she she didn't want she saw too many of them end up like that mm -hmm. she says that's not for me so, yeah. but your family name you know, when people hear it, they they automatically images pop in their head, uh, the history. So I really want you to tell me about your family's circus tradition because it goes back many generations. It's, I'm what seventh generation. We're seventh generation. My ch children. Oh no, my seventh or. I don't know. We are, I would say, we are the sixth generation. Okay. Your son, seventh, and your grandchildren are the eighth. Eighth generation. So how did your family get involved with the circus business? Well, we did a little research. We didn't. We found, Back in Napoleon's time, okay, the loyal family is like Smith. There's a lot of Smiths everywhere. Okay. The revolution broke out. Broke out. Well, the loyals kind of scattered. I guess a bunch of them went to Germany. Some went somewhere else to Italy, and some stayed in France. Our stayed in France, and uh, he used to break horses for Napoleon's army. And at the end of each conquest, would you say use it as conquest when they would conquer something and then he would give them grants to his soldiers and we had uh, where they would want land or whatever but ours didn't want that ours wanted canvas as much canvas as he could get like those tents that they used to make and from there our because our family used to have one pole and they had a ring and they would work out in the street with their horse act and they would get was it like contribution where they would donate donations donations well then when he worked for napoleon i guess worked for napoleon, he um didn't that's what he wanted he wanted canvas so they made their first tent and uh that's how the loyal family got started doing the bareback riding and then the Travaglia family, which is going to be the, our grandmother's side, they had a service in Italy for years and years. years, and years. Yes. So she, I, we can't even tell you how far back that goes because we don't know. Hmm. And there's no one alive to tell us. So. But um, my grandfather ended up marrying my grandmother. You saw how that came about. It was an arranged marriage because they were both quite talented and with horses and doing circus. So he really wasn't in love with our grandmother. He was in love with her sister. But because she was so talented and he was so talented, the family thought financially that that was the smartest move. It didn't matter what they liked. So that's how they got together. And in 1932, they came to the United States with Ringling Brothers and they went back. They went back to Europe. But then the war broke out. I think and when that happened, they came back and they I'm stayed permanent. I'm going to bust in there real quick. The first time they came was 1929. 32 is when they came and stayed. You're and right, stayed. I got it wrong. Uh, they came in 1929, mm -hmm. then they went back to Italy. And then um, they came back in 32, and that's, that's when they stayed here in that's 32. Correct. Yeah. And then the war broke out. And, um, and what's so funny is my mother's uncle, his name was El Demaro, but we called him Zio Tattoo or Zio Cento. 
he wasn't from show business and he winded up marrying my mother, I mean my father's and her mother's sister. So then when my mother married my father, it made double cousins and aunt. Well, we used to joke around and say, well, you're your own grandfather. <laughs> we, we can't piece that together. There's really no relationship there, but there is, you know. And, and that's like Adriano Nucci that made the disc. That would be his first cousin, but yet it would be his aunt. So it's really a good, uh oh, uh oh, that doesn't sound too good, but, but, uh, and pretty much, you know, all the, the families, there's real tight, real, even though we don't live close to each other, we're real, real tight family. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it's always been through the generations in Europe with, with all of us. How did your your parents learn what they learned about the circus? My grandfather. Our grandfather taught his children. And then when they had us, he taught us. And let me tell you what, it wasn't a fun experience because we would go to school all day long. Our parents insisted that we got an education because they were afforded that opportunity. And um, we would go to school all day and when we got home, we practiced every single day. Sometimes we didn't practice on Sunday and that was only because he didn't want to, he'd be tired or whatever. But we practiced every day. It was like we went to school and then we went to school. And uh, he was very, very strict. And he us. would, it, there would be tricks that he would invent on his own that, you know, what? He, I, I don't know how He to, came up with a one man flying act that I did. One person. And he rigged this thing up. I've got pictures of it. I'll show them to you later. And he wanted to take me to Europe with that. But my mother told him, I said, if you're going to take my daughter to Europe, it will be in the summertime. He said, well, she doesn't need to go to school. She's going to make a living doing that. She says, no, Dad, she's going to go to school. And then if you want to take her in the summertime when school's out, you can do that. Of course, they argued back and forth about that, but Mom just kept her foot down about that. But back to that flying act, you would, you would take a web, which is a long rope-looking thing. You would go up to this bar, trapeze. You would reach up above the trapeze, you'd stand on that, and then you would work your way up, and he had these straps that made loops. You would put your feet in these straps, and you'd go across those straps to this other bar. The upside down. Upside down. And my, my cousin used to say, well, how are we supposed to get from that bar to the other one? In Italian, you would say, come una mosca, that means like a fly. You would have to go across these straps to get to this other bar. Then you would do, hang from that, he'd bring a trapeze up to you, you would swing, you'd do the trick, and you'd catch the other bar. You didn't need a catcher. You were a one-man flying act. And he had me doing this crazy act. I'm just a few years younger than Dolly, not much. <laughs> but I remember, in fact, she had forgotten all about that, that trapeze. I had forgotten what happened to the bar, yeah. And I said, oh, you know, Dolly, I said, yeah, I was going to get this bar one day over at the old winter quarters in Sarasota, our winter quarters. I said, I seen it leaning up against this thing. And I said, I remember this trapeze. It used to hang up in the backyard. It was like a square. It had one trapeze at one end and one at the other. And I said, I remember you practicing on it. And you'd be on this and you would do like a forward somersault. They would meet. The two bars would meet and she'd be on one. And I said, you'd do a forward somersault and she would literally catch by her heels on the other trapeze and she's only like six seven eight years old and i was a lot smaller but i remember her practicing i would be down there practicing or she would be practicing i'd be watching and uh, dolly and them were more the aerial type people yeah, i never care for the horses and i'm strictly horses i i don't know if i got it from my father 
You and got it grand, on the loyal side, period. They're but all horse people. Horses, those are the most beautiful animal God ever put on this earth. They're horses. And uh, I eat, sleep, drink horses. That's true. And I still go out right now. In fact, I was up real early this morning taking care of horses. Hmm. Oh. Uh, well, what acts were, were your families known for in those early years? You know, when you're growing up, what are your, your parents doing? Oh, gosh. I, they did everything. They were known, though, as bareback riders, as equestrians. And then um, they, uh, but they did everything. My, like my Uncle Joe, he was hand balancing handstands, and and uh, my uh, my aunt my aunt uh, my aunt's husband Zio Tatu, he was teeter board. I mean, they all had their their um, how would you say? They it? all had their specialty, special but they were all versatile. Mm -hmm. They could do. They could walk in there, and they could be a one family so they could they could be one family circus they could tumble they could fly they did choir walking they did horses they did the cannon they did cloud swing they juggling juggling they if it was done trapeze. they did it mm -hmm. yeah and so that's what i'm saying you know the family was High big wire. and they could actually they could actually have done a complete circus of course you got tired of looking at the same ones over and over again but they could have done it I could see how that could be very attractive to Barnum. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. they, uh, the tricks that my uncles and my aunts did was very few ever accomplished. There was tricks many of them never even attempted to do. It, it's, and it's never been, they've never done it since. Mm -hmm. They've never done, done it since. My uncle Justino, he did somersault from the first horse to the fourth horse. Mm -hmm. Madison Square Garden, and it was just to show. There used to be amongst the among the circus performers a lot of rivalry. Is that what the That's word correct. competition? Rivalry um, is a good word for it. Competition and rivalry uh, about okay. So he did uh, somersault from horse to horse. Oh well, he did from the first horse to the third horse, mm -hmm. and so when they went to Madison Square Garden. There was two other riding acts there. There was the Christianis, and I believe, if I'm not wrong, Poodle Hannaford's. Mm -hmm. Hannaford's. Hannaford's. And so they put the loyal Rapinskis in the center because the Hannaford's were doing it from the first horse to the second horse, and uh, Christiani from the first horse to the third horse. Well, my Uncle Justina wasn't going to let anybody get away with with that, so he put a fourth horse in there. Now, yeah. you gotta understand, the horses were not back to back like you're seeing when they do from horse to horse, because it would have filled the ring up, so they had them angled. What they would do is, two is like, say the your fourth horse, okay, they'd be all in line, but when he got ready to throw his somersault, there'd be a command, my grandfather or my uncle, would say or do to them and the one horse instead of uh this it would be one of the two horses that are directly because he's going to go from the first horse to the fourth horse this number three horse would pull up beside it so actually he's doing it from the first horse to the third horse because that fourth horse pulled up and then he just drops back a little bit and my mom she did somersaults from horse to horse. She just did just about anything that any of the men did as far as horseback riding. She did somersaults through hoops. Through she hoops. did two hoops at the same time. They'd be holding a, a big hoop and she'd do it through the little hoop and go through the big hoop. She did it over banners, one right after the other. Doom, 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 doom. Then the two of my aunts, Estherina and Germana, they followed in our grandparents' footsteps as far as the part of the act that they did. And what is it called? It's called the Palidur. The Palidur. And the one we were talking about, Germana, she was always what they call the Porteur, which is the one on the bottom. She was the heavy as far as muscles and stuff went. 
and she, they would do a balancing, head balancing with them horses, moving, no hands. My aunt, they my were aunt so Germana good. would hold my aunt Albert uh, Estorina. They go head to head, no hands. Stand on her head, no hands. Handstand, hand to hand. Um, my aunt Germana uh, fell in love with uh, my uncle, who they had the Kanak, the zucchinis. I don't know if you've heard of them or not, but they were very famous. The problem with that was, is my grandfather blew a fuse because that was a big part of the act. He didn't want to lose her. So they snuck off and got married. And when they got back and she finally told my grandfather, her her wedding present was a slap. <laughs> <laughs> because she disobeyed him and they eloped and everything. Yeah, well, and they weren't allowed to, to... They didn't have any type of marital life until after the season yeah, was Yeah, there over. was no honeymoon. There was nothing. And it's because the fear of maybe her, you know, conceiving a child or something like that, and, it, and they had a contract. So they didn't really... They were married, but they weren't married, you know, until the end of the season. But he was really, really bad news when it came to... The girls getting married because he needed every one of them for that act. They all were special in their own way, and it took away from the from the from the act when they would get married and leave with their husbands, you know. And uh, when my father, when my mother, I should say, came to the United States in 1948 and uh, or 47, and uh, landed in Baltimore. And it was the night performance. We're going into the night performance. She had never been to a circus in her life, I don't guess. And so they picked her up at the airport, whoever. It wasn't anybody in the family. They sent somebody to pick her up. And when she got there, they took her straight to the dressing room. And they plucked her eyebrows and put a costume on her. Can and you imagine? Put makeup. My <laughs> mother didn't even know what it makeup. Her out there. <laughs> put high heels on her and they all marched in like you've seen on that tape where they all marched in well lord behold they have a big cape on her and a headpiece and these high heels <laughs> and they said just landed from sunny italy another <laughs> loyal repensky sister and she come she come wobbling out and falls down <laughs> and then the next morning at five o'clock in the morning my grandfather had her in the in the ring practicing how to walk in heels for starters. Yeah, she was <laughs> she was ready to go back to Italy. <laughs> and then well, since her and my dad had been writing each other and they fell in love through this letter through mail, and uh, when it was time for them to get married, my father was thirty two and he had to go ask his oldest sister, Albertina get permission to marry my mother. And she said no. <laughs> and so he went to his father. My grandfather told him, what did Albertina say? He said, Alberta said no. He said, then it's no. So a few days later, he uh, snatched her up and they took off. They eloped and went to Chicago and got married in Chicago. Oh, I didn't know they married in Chicago. Yep, they took off and got married in Chicago. Well, tell him a little bit about you. Well, actually, before we go into that, you know, you're you're growing up in in Sarasota. In this, what is you both of you I want you to tell me your earliest circus memory of working in the circus or practicing? Just in general, like your the the earliest circus memory when you finally get a grasp that you know this. I, I think I'm going to be about four years old. I'm going to say. I, Go ahead. I'm going to say about four years old, and, and it was Pollock Brothers. And I remember Jack Luentini, and um, they were, we were practicing a dog act. Somebody had a dog act. Who had a dog act? Phil Tattoo had a dog act. Mm -hmm. And they were practicing a dog act. That was my earliest memories of, of the dog, of practicing. My earliest memories were the winning quarters, the Raymond Brothers winning quarters. Winning quarters. I was little older. Yeah. And they were out there practicing, and I remember, I don't know why I remember this, it might be something I was told, but this is what I remember. 
They were out there practicing, and I remember running out to the ring. And everybody was hollering at me because I was little. And they were afraid the horses were going to run over me because I was trying to go to where my mother was at. And my grandfather had a whip, and he was hitting those horses because he was afraid that I was going to get trampled by the horses. And I believe that's my, that's a terrible memory, but that was my earliest memory was the fear of the horses. And I never did like the horses. Oh, and I loved the horses. I liked the horses. I didn't want any part of doing the horses. I hated practicing the trapeze. <laughs> my grandfather had a trapeze. My grandfather's house sat over here. It looked like an old medieval castle. That's what I always thought of that place, a medieval castle. Oh, it's that way, yeah. And so, and he had this fountain. And then there was like a roll of trees and some brushery or whatever. And then was my Aunt Albertina's house. Well, right there, they would set up this crane, uh, little upright bars with the trapeze would hang on that upright. Mm -hmm. And he would get Dolly and Olympia. And I was real little and me. And we would practice. Well, she was already great, but I hated it. And he used to spank me. Dolly knows about the spankings, but, um, and he used to spank me, but I hated trapeze, I hated it, but, and I hated tumbling. And I'll tell you another thing my grandfather used to make us, back in those days when you were a performer, you had to be able to do everything. You had to be able to act, you had to be able to play an instrument, you had to be able to do all of that. My grandfather, every day, after we practiced, we would have to go in the house, my Aunt Albertina, and we would have to sit there. And I had to learn to play a violin. No. I had a saxophone. <laughs> <laughs> and we were so bad. <laughs> and and Nucci had the, had the violin. Nucci had a violin and I had a violin. I don't know how my grandmother stood the noise. <laughs> Each one of the cousins had to play an instrument. And I think I think Ramo did the trumpet. Gus did the trumpet. Somebody had a trumpet. Gus did the trumpet. Ramo did a sax too. But let me tell you a story about the saxophone. <laughs> it was called a soprano saxophone that was about this tall. Oh my arms hurt, but anyway, it's about this tall. It was really a short sax. And there was always a method to my grandfather's madness. He wanted me to learn how to play that thing while I was doing tricks on the trampoline. <laughs> and I was supposed to play this stupid song. <laughs> and, you know, I'd have a busted lip all the time. I'm doing a trick and I'm, it's going down my throat. <laughs> I could not wait to get rid of that saxophone. I, my grandfather came up with some real... He got a bear one time. A black bear. The name of that bear was <laughs> Martin, which is Martin in English. He got it when it was like this, little bitty, cup. oh, cute little cup. And he kept it down there at the Ringling Brothers Winter Quarters. Every day we'd go down there, clean out the cage, feed the bear. The problem was the bear started growing. <laughs> he was getting big, you know. And he got to looking at us like lunch. You know? <laughs> so we went down there one day, and my grandfather had these whips. And he called them vitamin A, B, and C. You never wanted to get to A. For some reason, school that was good, but with him that was not good. A is not good. And when we were practicing, he would use those whips. Yeah. He was like, but he, here's this bear. And this, la this day we walked down there, and me and Avery, the one that made the video, he says, go in there, clean the cage, and feed the, the bear. And I said, I'm not going in there. And he said, Go in there, clean a tag me, he's telling me, go in there, clean the cage, and feed the bear. I'm not going in there. He says, I'm going to go get vitamin C. I said, I don't care if you bring A, B, and C. <laughs> I'm not going back in that cage. <laughs> I never did go back in that cage. And that bear never did ride the horse. And that bear turned out me. Oh, he, he was going to raise it up to ride on the horse, this bear on the horse. I don't know if he's going to put one of us on top of it or what. We never got that far. <laughs> but, but my grandfather, my one cousin, and he'll tell you, Gus, he said, my grandfather was, wasn't a very patient man. And when you went to practice or learn something, 
and he'd tell you to do it. He expected you to to do it right then. There was no learning you know. time. It, I mean, he told you to do it, and you had to do it. And, and he expected it to be right. How can you do something you've never done before? He had the two cousins that she's talking about do a tumbling act. And in this act, my older of the two cousins was supposed to throw Ramo up in the air, this is his brother, get down on his knees, and, and Ramo was supposed to land on his back, on, on his back, on, back on. to back. They practiced and they practiced and they practiced. He would it take was him, impossible. Like, I couldn't do it. My cousin, um, Justine knows his name, but we call him Gus, Bebito. Mm -hmm. And he would take my cousin Ramo. Throw and he'd up. have to throw him up in the air. And get down. And he would have to bend over. Well, while he's bending over, Ramo has to be doing a somersault. <laughs> and land on his back. And land on his back, back to back. Back to back. Well, they never did it. They never could do it. And then when my grandfather got through with him, then my uncle Justino started in on him. Well, Ramo got to where he was calling in sick a lot. <laughs> he was one that got all the spankings because... Gus was doing his part. He was the bottom man. He'd get down. Well, his part wasn't the hard part. Rainbow's part, the laying on his back, was hard. And so he was always, you know, he was sick a lot. <laughs> and Ramo, my Aunt Albertina, who you saw doing the incline on the wire, taught my cousin Ramo to do a wire act. He was fantastic. There's nobody, nobody. There was a famous wire walker called Concolino. Concolino. My cousin surpassed Concolino hmm. in in wires. And I feel real bad that I don't have a photo to show you of him doing somersaults, one right after the other on the wire. He was really good. And uh, I don't know, una plancha. I don't know how to say plancha in English. It's a layout. A flat layout. Some It's a flat straight. He Instead does, of tucking... For a you're summer song, out. you're straight out. Absolutely gorgeous. And you see the wire. You can see him. And he's straight up and down with his feet, his head down, going into a, it's. He was fantastic. He was fantastic. But he didn't like circus. Well, when, when you were younger, did you have a choice? No. As to, <laughs> you're like, for nothing. <laughs> As to, you know, what you wanted to do? Like, you didn't really want to work with horses? Yeah, they tried me on the horses. They tried me on the horses. And I could stand up and I could kneel and I could do a few things like that. But they, they could see I wasn't cut out for that. And I always was trying to go swing from things. Hmm. So that's where the trapeze came in. And see, and I was the opposite. But you had to do something. There wasn't no, I, I didn't like the trapeze. I just didn't, it didn't. And I hated the flying act. I would never let go is what my problem was. I ain't gonna let go. They're nuts. I'm perfectly fine holding on. See, I wouldn't let go. And she I was just, down in Jacksonville. <clears throat> I was already up in my thirties when this happened and I went down to see them. And just get up on the fly roof, you know. Oh, yeah. Over so there. I did. I went up and, and I, I tell you exactly out. it was Alfredo and yeah. uh Morales' flying out. I went out and I showed out real good, you know, what I could do and what I they did real good. And I had to be at work the next day. I was already in law enforcement then. So I go home and I go to bed. And the next morning, I crawled to the bathroom. <laughs> there was just nothing that didn't hurt. <laughs> Every I was like, oh, body. golly, let me just get there. <laughs> I'm going, I'm too old for this. I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> but you remembered how to do it, though. Yeah, like yes, I said. Yes. I mean, Once you don't you ever something. forget. Once you learn something, you never. It's like riding a bicycle. Ever. You know, mm -hmm. you don't forget. Now, mentally, I can still do it. But. Like Dolly tells you, she can do all them tricks in her mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, where were your parents while your grandfather was? Oh, the road with circus. They were working. Parents. We would stay home with our grandmother and, and we grandfather would go to school. because they insisted he went to school. As soon as school let out, back then it let out in June. I mean, they put us immediately on a plane and sent us to where they were at. And sometimes we actually worked. I worked a little bit with Ringland. And um, I didn't start working till 1950, oh, I'm going to say probably 56, 57. 
So your early years, you're going to school just like regular kids. You're are you, you're in Sarasota, I take it. Mm -hmm. She is. You are. Uh, but, but see, we moved. We moved to Oakland. Well, we didn't move. We were traveling on a small circus called Benson Brothers or Kelly Morris at the time, and they're out of Gibson Town, Florida. And I don't know where we went to visit Algie Kelly Miller, and. Uh, I remember having them announcing that we were there visiting and my dad and my mother stood up and we waved and we sat back down. And then Mr. Miller had made arrangements with my dad for us to come on their show, which was based here in Hugo, Oklahoma, the original Algie Kelly Miller Circus. And so we moved to Hugo. We came to Hugo in 19, the winter of 1955 to open in March of 56 and uh, I hadn't been practicing that long with my grandfather because I was born in 49 and uh, my grandfather passed away in 56 and we had to leave the show. I remember us leaving the show in October to go to, to Florida when my grandfather But then my mother worked with Kelly Miller's son too. She yeah. Then different ones did. Uh huh. Then um, uh, and I, you know, we were looking at those pictures, and there was Lily Strepitov. You come saying, hey, "What's her name, Strep?" And I said, "Oh, that's Lily Strepitov. I don't remember her looking like that, but because I remember her in later years. But um, yeah, but your mom and them had all come to work on the Kelly Miller mm -hmm. Circus on Alger Kelly Miller, and that's when your mother, your our Uncle Justino was supposed to give your mother Rocca, her horse, mm -hmm. which he didn't. And he sent Cincinnati instead. Cincinnati was getting up in age, too. And I learned to ride on his horse called Cincinnati. He belonged to the family way back when. When that horse died, he was 32 years old. Mm -hmm. But I learned to ride on Cincinnati. He was a golden Palomino mm -hmm. Belgian. And Papa would try to like retire him because by then we had younger horses and he would get loose off the truck and he would come running into the tent, this poor old horse, and he would get right in his place where he, he was always the second to the last horse. Mm -hmm. And I he, didn't know he did that. Oh yeah, Cincinnati would get loose and he'd come in and he'd get between Dolly and Chulo every time. Dolly the horse. Oh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> We named a horse I really dolly. need to clarify that. <laughs> <laughs> my our very my very first horses. Well, the very first horse I had was named Ginger, but and here I'm like five and six years old when we got Ginger. But then um, when we went came to to Algie Kelly Miller, Papa bought horses, and one was named Pat, and. Uh, Dolly, we named her after you. Thank you. And we had our very first Chulo. And that's where we got, and then, well, I had Cincinnati, and Cincinnati would get loose, and he'd always come in and go right between those two horses. And Papa couldn't get him out. He had to, we had to finish the act. Her father was such a fantastic horse trainer. He was very good with patience. My dad wasn't known for being a, I mean, he was a writer, he was an average writer, he was good, but he wasn't anything like my Uncle Justino or my Aunt Zepta. But what he liked in being a bareback rider, he made up for training the horses. And my uncles and my aunts will all tell you, the horses that my grandfather and my father put out, nobody else ever. And not only that, Lucy, they had no act without the horses. Well, that's he, true. You had to have that, so his his part was so terribly important. Like the, I was telling you about the somersault from the first horse to the fourth horse. The horse that threw my uncle, my grandfather and my father taught him that all they had to do was like tap him in a certain place or step in a certain place on him and the horse automatically knew to, to give 
to give them that extra, like a buck. Yeah. To throw them up. In fact, there's a picture mm -hmm. that you have, and I'll, I was on that thing, mm -hmm. that your mother's doing the somersault, and you can see where the horse is. You, you can actually see where he's, Where she's throwing. It's like kind of like giving her a boost. Yep. Where she's giving her the boost, because there's a certain way that she can touch her or whatever, and that horse would give her that boost. Well, what goes into training a horse? Patience. We talked to her about that. A lot of patience. And it's um, consist consistency. Is mm -hmm. that how you say that? Consistency? Doing the same thing over and over and over. And you don't beat them. You don't hit them. You don't smack them in the face. Where a lot of people get the wrong conception, it's treats. When they do something good, well, okay, you teach them. This is the way I was taught. Okay, you want them to learn to do run the ring. Okay, first, I walk them around the ring more several times a week, whatever, so they know repetition, the the, the outlay of the ring and and whatever, that they know that's what they have to do. Then, you trot them a little bit. So they don't get dizzy. Horses are like people. You run in a circle, you're going to get dizzy. They got to learn to run a little bit, stop. Maybe one round, stop. Run round, stop. They get that, and then you add another round. Then you add another round. And then eventually they're not getting dizzy, and neither are you. But you stand there and go like that too, you get dizzy. So they get it, and they go around maybe four, five, six times, and then you stop them, so that gives them time to... And then after a while, it doesn't bother them anymore. But it's consistency, and like, whenever they did, they learn, and we stop them, bravo, good boy. And you pet him, and you give him a sugar, the little sugar cubes. Or well, now they have treats for horses, so I just go down and buy the treats, because after they slobber all over, your hands get all sticky. <laughs> and those treats are a lot easier. They're not all <laughs> sticky. But when we used to practice and stuff, I would always go so I could steal those sugar cubes. I'd be sitting there. <laughs> Can I have one? You were eating the horse's treats? Yes, I used to like the sugar cubes. I'd, go. <laughs> I'd just go over to practice just so I could have sugar cubes. <laughs> you did that. <laughs> sure did. But, um, and it's just consistency, you know, and um, patience, a lot of patience with the animals. And that's pretty much all animals, you know. You, every now and then you get, it's like everything, you always get one rotten apple somewhere along the way, and it spoils it for everybody else. Mm -hmm. so. But no, I tell you something, my grandfather and my father and I was taught this. We take so good care of our horses. They're the ones that put the bread and butter on the table. You have to take care of them. They're the ones that make your living. Without those animals, you have nothing. You can walk to a Coke machine. You can walk to the water bucket or your water fountain or whatever and get a drink of water or go make you a sandwich. Those horses don't. They depend on you. All animals depend on you, the elephants, the the lions, the tigers, the dogs, the ponies, they depend on you to take care of them. And um, before any of us, especially with my father, our horses ate before we ate. Always got taken care of before we got taken care of. And always, that was instilled in us ever since that, well in me, because I did the horses, but instilled I think pretty much in all my cousins that the animals were first. And pretty much everybody in show business that has animals, you have to take care of them first because they depend on you. They're like part of the family. They're, I was sitting here at that and I was going telling Dolly, oh yeah, I remember this work. And she's looking, well, how do you, I guess from being around my father. But I remember, she says, oh, Manalik, I don't remember that. Oh, well, I remember Manalik. And she's, and I remember Palermo. I remember the names. Also. And I remember New York. I remember them. And I remember Cincinnati. I, I remember the name Rocca, but I don't remember Rocca. I remember Rocca. And uh, they had a horse called Marna, and she never remembered Marna. She was a white horse. 
and uh, uh, but you were more into the horses. How were knaves decided? Was it on the horses? Uh huh. I, here's what I think. I honestly believe it's where they got the horse. One of them was named New York. Think about it. One of them was named Cincinnati. One of them was named, um, there was another one named after a town. I don't remember what it was. But I think that they didn't know what else to call them. So they oh, there was them. Savoia. Do you remember Savoia? I remember Savoia. But the rest of the names, I don't, I don't know how they came up with those names. And Savoia's onion. Why would they name you Savoia? Was it why? <laughs> now, my horses. And why was that when they dolly? <laughs> <laughs> Papa, named, Papa named her dolly. I don't know why I named her dolly. And then the other one, his name was uh, some other name. And he was so pretty that they called him Chulo, which means beautiful in Spanish. Que chulo, que chulo. So they named him Chulo. And uh, then I got some Belgian horses back in, oh, I want to say late 80s, somewhere in the 80s, 90s, 80s. And uh, wait till I tell you their names. One was named Alexander McKee. The other one was named Pasconel. The other one was named Clay Basket. And one, I don't even want to know. The other one was I named- I those names, I do want to know. The other one was named Seacom. I was so, I'm so into that Centennial, that oh. mini-series Centennial. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen that mini-series Centennial? I was into that mini-series Centennial. And it's about a French, French hi, I, how weird, a French, uh, uh, what do you call him, trapper. A French trapper, Canadian French trapper that come to the United States and back in the cowboy days. when mm -hmm. he's a mountain man. And these were characters out of that movie, and his name was Pasconel. Oh, and then I had one named Jake, Jake Pasconel. That was the son. Then I had Mikey. Okay. Well, that was the other son. <laughs> <laughs> were, were you raised in a like a bilingual household? Yes. Yes. In fact, when I first started school, I did not speak English. I spoke Italian. I understood it but we didn't speak it because my grandmother and grandfather didn't speak English. So we didn't speak a lot of English. My grandmother, my grandmother, till the day she died, I think she only knew maybe five words in English. Hello? She'd say, come here when she wanted you to leave and go away when she wanted you to come here. And <laughs> <laughs> she knew a few words, not me. Yeah, they didn't, none of them spoke English. And my grandfather English. never spoke English. Hmm. He spoke he spoke Italian, and when he'd get mad, he'd speak French hmm. because he's French. But I don't, we never, we were talking about that yesterday. Why did we speak Italian instead of French? Because they were both uh, French hmm. nationals. But my grandmother was Italian because the last name Travaglia, that's Italian, that's not French. So apparently, you know, she spoke more Italian than she did. But French. I think that when they went to Italy, because when they were with the Travaglia, which was in Italy, mm -hmm. the Travaglia side of the the family, because like where Z and then Pratt uh, learned, did her eye wire and everything, it was all in, in Italy. It was all it, in it Italy. It was because the Travaglia Circus was in and, Italy. And then like my father was born in Italy. My and, mother was born in Sicily. And mm -hmm. so, you know, they pretty much left France and went to Italy. And I think because of the circuses, I'm not real sure. How old were each of you when your grandfather passed away? He passed away in 56, so I was 12 when he passed away. And you're five years younger than I am, so that would have made you about seven. Hmm. Who took over that role then? I'm sorry? Who took over his role? My uncle and my Aunt Albertina mm -hmm. took over the role. And that's when a little bit later on the family kind of Went their separate ways. Yeah, the sir, they stayed. I want to say mom stayed just a, a couple of I more think years, when they so finally, so. finally dissolved everything was in 1959. And I'm going to tell you, Z. Albertina and your mother came to Gil Gray in Dallas. Mm -hmm. To, we were going to, they, well, I wasn't, they were. It was uh, Papa, Mama, your mother, Z. Albertina. 
they were going to put a writing act together for Gil Gray, and I don't know what happened. Uh, they couldn't get them all together because my Aunt Germana had married my Uncle Bruno, and then they had gotten out of the circus, and he had uh, rides and stuff at the carnival. And then Zio Justino went to and the Ringling Show. He he started his own circus, his, his own his own troupe, and he separated. And then my other aunt Estorina married, and they went to New Jersey. And so it and was then just, Zia Simona was with Zio Eddie. So they kind of just they it was just, time. It really was time. They were getting married. And the only one actually after they the the family busted up, and they all all of them went into carnival business with having uh, rides. rides, dark rides and, you know, glass houses and all of that stuff, spook houses and stuff, except for my father. And my father stayed true to his, his, uh, his, heritage. his heritage in circus. But now, my Uncle Justino, in a way, did stay. Yes, he did, because he, of my cousin. He did that, but he also was going up to Sailor Circus. And he was helping train those no, kids. No, and I forgot. Not only that, he was ringmaster on the Ringling Circus. He did and, that. And he was a question director and, and stuff. Right. But he stayed active with Sailor Circus. And he would go, and they call him uh, Papa, Papa, Papa Loyal. Loyal. And he'd go up there and he'd help train all those kids at the high school. And he did that up until he got to where he was unable to do anything like that. Yeah, he got, he got um, Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and... and, uh, and he, that he couldn't do that no more. But but they loved him dearly. Mm -hmm. They really did up at Sailor Circus. And uh, but but uh, and then my cousin Timmy, I forgot. Yeah, I'm sorry, I left him out. But he uh, Timmy finished high school and he went to Sailor Circus and everything. And but Timmy had the blood in him to be a bareback rider. And let me tell you, he is as good as my uncle. The only one out of the, his four children, out of Justino's four children, that did, the, as far as I know, didn't do anything in the circus was Danny. Gus did. He yeah, did no, horseback Danny riding. Didn't do nothing. Randall did wire, and Timmy did horseback no, riding. But Timmy Danny didn't, didn't, didn't do just, nothing. Oh, Danny didn't. No, Danny didn't do anything. Uh, and then Timmy, of course, Timmy, like now, he's somewhere in. Where did I want to say they were in New Hampshire? And uh, when I talked to him earlier and he said, oh, I passed Timmy yesterday. They were in, in uh, Massachusetts. They were setting up in Mass. I couldn't stop. All I did was drive by, but I saw the truck and the trailer and stuff with the horses. I think what's impressive about all of this is the fact that you go back eight generations and there's still some family that's still doing circus. That's a long, long time. And my cousin, uh, Timmy, is training his daughter. She's got her kids doing it, and he and her kids have got their kids doing it. My grandkids. That's I had, a long time. Mm -hmm. I told you the story about my Aunt Zefta and my Aunt Estherina and my Aunt Albertina getting a little ticked off at me because my last daughter, Tina, was supposed to be named after one of the aunts, and they got into a, a squabble over which name. Well, it's all your fault. If you'd have had seven like you intended to, you'd have had a name for every one of them. I know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, uh, I, uh, my son, when he had his, he had his first son, and he's named after my father. His name, well, my father's name isn't Christian, but his name is Alfonso. So Christian's name is Alfonso Joseph after my father and my brother who passed away. And so then their second child was a little girl. And they promised, they promised if it was a girl, her name would be Zefta. And so my Aunt Zefta was here for the birth and, and everything. And she was so happy that there was a Zefta after, well, her name's Zefta. Well, she couldn't count on me because I had all boys. And so, I was a big disappointment to her. And so we had a Zefta, and boy, she was the happiest thing. And now, my Aunt Zefta's youngest daughter, Gina, her son got married, and we finally have a little Zefta, mm -hmm. another little Zefta. And so my daughter, 
Mona. We call her Mona. Her name is Simone after my aunt, the youngest aunt that passed away. And uh, her too for a long time. I named her after her and finally one of her daughters, they named their daughter Simona. Yeah. Uh, the youngest one, Monique. Monique named her Simona. daughter Simona. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then of course I have Josie and her name is Germana, but we call her Josie, but she's named after my Aunt Germana. And uh, she's kind of built like my Aunt Germana too. Too bad she didn't have the sense my Aunt Germana had. I haven't seen Josie in a long time. So she looks just she like Zia. Just, just like Zia. Last time I saw her. And what's funny is when we went to Florida, they have this thing that they call Armour's, uh, I can't say St. Saint Armand Circle. Explain to them what it is, darling. It's it's in Sarasota, Florida, and it's on the way out to Lido Beach. And it's, it's called St. Armand Circle because it is a circle, and they've got little stores and shops all around the circle. It's a big tourist attraction area. And in the center of that, it's like a, uh, a small park. It's got benches and things like that. All the way around that thing, they have different circus performers. They've got plaques that are in the ground. They're, they're round, they're not square like a plaque, but they're round. And they have their dates and, and what they did and on and so forth. And our family is in that St. Armand Circle. Every, every year they and can. Every year they put a new circus family or performer in that circle. So it's, it's kind of a neat thing. Well, and so we went down for that, and of course my youngest daughter Tina was little. She was, I'm gonna say maybe five, and uh, she remembers her aunt Germana, and she says, "All I can remember, she didn't, couldn't, wouldn't call me my name. She would always call me Pichinina, 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 Pichinina. This is Figa Namcisa. <laughs> we, uh, that's the names our aunts used to call us all the time, and. Uh, but circus is in our blood, actually. And we were talking about the new generation and everything. Now, my granddaughter, Zefta, she stands. I'm going to send that DVD with you. Mm -hmm. And you can see her standing, practicing, and learning. To, which she wrote when she was little, till she was about, oh, I'm going to say maybe four or five years old, four years old, five years old. And then she didn't write anymore and strictly in school and that was pretty much it. And uh, uh, she started practicing again, I'm gonna say a couple of years ago. And uh, she's doing really, 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 really good. And they're all practicing, all, the, all my grandkids are pretty much practicing. And uh, they love the circus, in fact, I think Zefta left yesterday, Zefta and Renzo left yesterday for Kelly Miller to be with Armando on the show. No vitamin A, B, and C? Oh. <laughs> that stuck yeah. with you, did it not? <laughs> yeah, there's a little it stuck vitamin. to me a lot, too. <laughs> there's a little bit of vitamin A, B, and C. That was so funny because, you know, on that DVD my cousin made for us, none of us talked about what we were going to say or anything. They just came in and they said, oh, um, Nucci's going to do a DVD out there. He wants to interview you. Would you go out there and give him an interview? And it's so funny because nobody really paid any attention. I, well, everybody was inside and just one at a time, oh, Nucci wants you, and they'd go out. And so when we got the DVD and we're sitting there looking at this DVD, we're going, oh, my gosh. He's talking about A, B, and C. Oh my God! She's talking about and if A, you B. Look at it. Every one of us talked about that A, B, and C. Well, how could you forget that? I mean, you know, that wasn't a pleasant. But see, I didn't say A, B, or C. I said he. I remember a lot of spankings. I got a lot of spankings. I got a lot of well, spankings. For your information, it's A, B. <laughs> I, said, I said, oh, I remember. All. And. Christian was looking at it, and he had a bunch of his high school friends here, and they're looking at it, and they're, you know, uh, laughing, and they go, when it got through with it, and he says, what is with you people? Everything is the A, A B, or C, or you're going to die. 
everything you're talking about drowning and the other one's talking about getting blowed up and in, in her video her best memories with the families when we were in cuba with my cousins with your cousins I and we were it. hiding under beds and because they were bombing in cuba they were blowing I remember it up the revolution. The, revolution the revolution that was her we best there. memories <laughs> I said, and it was fun. To me, it was fun. My grandmother would snatch us up, and a bunch of us, she took our clothes and tied us together so we wouldn't get lost. And we'd be running down the street, and we're all hooked on to each other. And we would go, they'd hide us under the beds and, and stuff because of the bomb. And I remember one of the hotels was Hotel Bronze, Bronze, Hotel Bronze was one of the hotels. And, uh, yeah, and I said, that was one of my funnest times. And oh, it is, fun. it was. It was for me. Oh, I had a lot of fun with my cousins. Hmm. I thought it was fun. And back then on the circus, too, it was a lot different. Everybody looked out for everybody's child. We could go outside and we could play and say so-and-so, uh, Canistrelli's who lived over here, their kids were outside playing, and... The Bisbeenies, they lived over here in their trailer, and their kids were... Everybody watched everybody else's children. Uh, they were always supervised. They, they weren't... Maybe we weren't directly... They weren't directly outside standing over them, but the, we, we always knew. There was always somebody watching us. And um, the kids could go outside and play and, and stuff, and you didn't have to worry about anything anymore and it's like I tell my daughter Josie who's on Carson Barnes I said Josie watch Maya Josie watch Juju Josie watch uh, you don't know who's out there before you used to know everybody anymore you have no clue these people are coming from different parts of the world different you know and we don't know things have changed so much from when we were on the circus you know, when we, we were kids on the circus and we would go, and back then, the Greenman Brothers uh, had the trains. And we would have one, almost a whole train by ourselves, because we had a big family. And then we would have, inside the train, there would be like an aisle going up the middle, and then there would be what they call state rooms. And each, like my uncle would have his room, and then my mother, and then and through this whole section over here. And I remember when we would come into town, it was so exciting to be all those people standing out there watching you. And you were so, in, we thought we were important. It wasn't us, but us kids, like, <laughs> yeah, we'd, go, we'd go and stand on the end, like, here we are, you know. And they weren't looking at us. They were looking at the elephants and the horses. And, but we thought we were important. You know, so. and, and I used to love that part of it, just riding the train and going from town to town and watching them put the tent up. And Well, when you were growing up, did you think, this is what I want to do, too? I think I did when I was little, but then it got to be a job because they started working me in the circus when I was like six. And they would take me out of school and take me to South America and Central America and Cuba. And then I had to come home and make that work up at school. And we were talking about that this morning. And it got to where I felt like I had to do it. And so when I got older, I pulled away from it because it was so pushed on me all my life, you know, that I wanted to run away from it, and, and I did. I and see, to. and I was the opposite. I hated school. I was telling her this morning how I hated school. I, it's not, I don't know, I, I was trying to explain to her, I said, Dolly, I hated it. I literally hated it. I said, I would be taken out of school in March. I would come home in November. I would have to do all that catching up. I hated school. And it's not that I was dumb or stupid or anything. My mother left me here one year in 1960 with a lady named Ruby Doyle. I called her Aunt Ruby. And I used to make straight Fs. I've gone to school with everybody in Hugo, Oklahoma. Oh, Lucy, yeah, I know her. I went to school <laughs> with her. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, I went to school with her. I have. I have class pictures with everybody in you. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, and I love and, every one of them. And some of them are 19. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I made straight F's. 
I did. I made straight F's. The only thing I made an A in was conduct. I kept my mouth shut. I could, didn't know anything to say. I guess that was your second career, right? <laughs> well, so anyway, when I stayed home that year with Ruby, after Mom and them left on, went on the road, my grades, I made straight A's. I made straight A's. And my teachers were going, Lucy, what, how are you, are you cheating? And I'm going, no. And they'd say, okay, well, say, tell me what this and what you read or, or my multiplications and all of that. And it was due to Aunt Ruby because Aunt Ruby would make me sit there and apply myself and do my work. And if I didn't do it, I didn't go play. I didn't do, I stayed there till I learned it. And so I made straight A's. Well, summer vacation came and I didn't go on the show. I stayed here with Ruby. And then school started. I still straight, made straight A's. Well, Mom and Papa come home off the road. And um, back then, Mama used to pay Ruby $50 a month for me to stay there and go to school. Well, Aunt Ruby would say, well, leave her with me, Lily. Alfonso, you don't have to pay me just so she keeps me company because her husband got a job in Dallas and he would only come in on the weekends. And her kids were all grown and out of out of school. Her youngest one graduated the year I stayed with her. And so, of course, me, no, no, I wanted to be with Mama. And of course, Mama didn't speak English that well. Papa really didn't go to school. I think he was third grade and that was about it. And uh, Mama graduated, but it was all in Italy, you know. And so they never pressed me or made me do my work. And I could care less because I didn't want nothing to do with it anyway. I wanted show business and show business it was. I finally quit junior high. I was 15 years old, just getting ready to go in the ninth grade. And here I'm going to the ninth grade with 11 year olds. <laughs> I don't think so. So I, I quit school. And at times I regret it because I didn't get to go, okay, get involved in like the senior prom and I, you know, and they have the high school reunions and things like that, that I, I think I would have enjoyed now that I'm older, look back and think, oh, well, that would have been a nice memory, you know, and do this and do that. And so when I had my kids, I made sure my kids went to school, got an education, and got the best of both lives, got the circus. Now, my two oldest ones were never going to be in show business. And where are they? On the circus. They both went to OU. Mona went one day longer than Armando. Josie, she didn't want anything to do with college. Um, Tina uh, graduated and got married to a young man in the service, and uh, that's about it, though. And, and see, my children were just the opposite. I Americanized my children totally. They know about the circus. They know what I did. They see the pictures, but they were never involved in it. Hmm. And uh, in fact, um, two of them had businesses, appliance businesses, and my middle boy's career Navy. But they're totally out of the circus. Do I have regrets? In a way, I do. I wished I had spent a little more time uh, teaching them some of the things. But back then, I was really, really pulling away from it. And now, and my grandkids, we we push them. We keep them in school. Um, I have two that are going to graduate this coming year, but they're both involved in the circus. Christian is absolutely, uh, he wants to go out and buy his own horses now. And uh, and stuff and uh, and Kylie of course is with her mother. You asked me about the costumes; those are for Kylie's mother's mother-in-law circus. And Kylie this year did web in the circus. It's her first year to do web in the circus. And um, of course, Kylie did hula hoops a couple of times when she was little, and she did. Uh, worked in the writing act with me when she was smaller. And uh, 
Zefta worked in the writing act. Christian worked in the writing act. I'm trying to think of Channing, no. Maya, no, not yet. Um, no. And but my youngest grandson, Argio, who's the same age as Lexi, about three. He's a clown on Kelly Miller, and a very good little clown at that. He loves it. It's in his blood, I think. So, uh, they all, all of them, though, practice writing. Like the tape I'm going to let, or the DVD I'm going to let you take. You can see them all practicing. And, uh, but it's like everything. Circus has its good times. It has its bad times. It has its happy times. It has its sad times. Um, I'm like Dolly. She left the circus. I love the circus. I couldn't. I couldn't exist without the circus. I couldn't. Uh, there'd be no way. Even now, I'm so still involved in it. But I think that it was so ingrained in us that we can. I can be out of it and walk over and be in it. Yeah. I understand it. I, mm -hmm. It's part of my history. So I don't have the, the, the fear of ever losing that for myself, but I did lose it for my children. Lots of times um, I feel, I don't know, I feel lost or something. And to get, you know, I'm going to sound really stupid. <laughs> no, I, I hadn't done it in a while. But you've seen those metal wash tubs that they sell at I went and bought, in fact, I've still got, I went and bought one. And I, and this was at the old place. And I'd go outside and I'd fill it up and I'd get a sheet. I know you're going to think I'm stupid. And I had put up a clothesline and I would get those clothes pins. Uh -huh. And I'd put it all up and I'd put that tub in there where the water spigot is. And I would go take a bath in it so I could feel like I was on the surface. And it, doesn't that sound, I know it sounds stupid. But it's a part of me that, that I miss and I like and I enjoy. And, you know, I said, God, you know, a lot of people can't live without their buttons and their cell phones, their computers. I said, what are they going to do if they ever cut the water? What are they going to do if there's never any lights? How are they going to survive? I'll survive because I know how. That's right. I know how to do with my mother. Of that stuff. My mother had three buckets, and she had her name on every one of them. And Lord, do not get one of her buckets. <laughs> she would send somebody to go get her water because, like you know, when you first get on the lot stuff, there was no other way to get clean. There wasn't any showers like they have now. You know, things later on in life, then they ended up having trains or, or areas where you could go shower. But in that back in those days, self-contained trailers, they didn't, didn't have self-contained trailers. And Lord, you didn't touch that bucket of water. You know, she had her three buckets of water. Don't even look at them. Do you know, <laughs> today, I can take a bath in a gallon of water yeah. and wash my hair and, ha and rinse my hair and take a complete bath in a gallon of water. But it was out of necessity. It really was. <laughs> When the kids, now we have those self-contained trailers where you have your running water, even though there's only so much water can fill in that tank. And we're on the show, okay, there's water, the trailer's full. You get wet, you shut it off, you soap up, you rinse off. That way there's plenty of water for the rest of them, you know, and they go, so we come home. And they turn the water on, they give and they shut it off, and they get soaked up. And then I said, No, you can leave this one running. <laughs> We've got running water. <laughs> and it, but it's just it's a way that they um learn to conserve. And the same with the lights. Oh God, I don't want no lights on. If you're not in there using them, and you're lucky you got lights on right now. <laughs> because on the road, the lights came on at a certain time. They went off at a certain time. You better have everything you needed done in that, that needed lights. In fact, I'm going to tell you a story. My mom and dad had just gotten this new trailer. It was a Midway. And our lights went out. Well, way back when, they used to have those candles. They still have those candles. And so you had it in a candle holder. And then I put it up 
on this little shelf by the window. Well, Lord and behold, the little wind came up, but I didn't. I left it on and I went and did the writing it. We come back, the front of the trailer was on fire oh, wow. because that curtain had caught on fire. That's scary. And, and, and uh, well, they got it out though. We still had a trailer. <laughs> but had that, you remember that old Midway over there? Did you, did you ever notice that burnt area? It was darker. Well, they I never knew it. why. I do now. <laughs> now you know. They clean. Well, they cleaned it all and then everything, and they, they, uh, I don't know, with sandpaper, and then they varnished it. But it was always darker than the rest because mm. that side of the trailer was on fire. <laughs> yeah. So, was that a major decision when they decided to to get a trailer? Yeah. Um, when my father and my mother first got married and everything. And back then it was like the whole family was together, you know, and they got one salary. You know, uh, I'm going to use this for an example. Say they got $1,500 a week. Okay. And there's how many in this family? There's my grandfather, Mothers. my grandmother, my aunt Albertina and her husband. There's there were uh, seven kids in their and, and their and, and their husbands and wives. Well, that fifteen hundred dollars, you might have got ten. Because, the money, my grandfather controlled, and my aunt, my aunt Albertina, they paid for all the. Everybody ate together. I mean. Everything, was there okay? All your needs were taken care of. But the, money went into a pool and, and okay. so that in the winter time they would have money to survive on. To survive on, okay. Now, if the aunts or the uncles or whoever made extra money, that money they would use to buy their own trailer or, or, or whatever. But say they didn't, it was a family trailer. So if they just made a decision, my grandfather and my aunt would make the decision or my grandfather, aunt, and my uncle Justino, who were the oldest, are the ones that took care of the rest of the family. And so when my father married my mother, they got him a car. They're, they they either had a car or they had a trailer. Well, they couldn't bring a trailer because they didn't have anything to pull it with. So they chose a, a Woody. Do you remember what a Woody is? Okay, they had a Woody. And so they uh, would go when they worked wherever the buildings were. They always had stalls for the horses and stuff. And Papa would pull that little woody right up next there. Mama would unload it. She'd move into a stall. She'd put her hay bales of hay and they'd drape something over it. That's at the table. <laughs> that she'd put her little electric stove up there. and. And that's so she wrote back to her mother in Italy, I feel like the Virgin Mary. <laughs> I'm living in a stall. All I need is a cow and a sheep. <laughs> but, um, but that's how they did for a real long time. But it always went through the older family, you know, the eldest. And if they had the money, then they'd buy them. Okay, now you get the trailer or, or like that. Unless... They had a side act or something that they did on their own that didn't conflict with the family, and they made extra money. That money was theirs to do what they wanted with. I remember one year, my mother and dad had bought a brand new trailer, and they already had the car. They had a Buick, and we put <coughs> it on the lot. I guess I might have been about six, maybe even seven. Anyway. They pulled it on the lot. And my mother, he says, where do you want to park this thing? So she points to some tree. My dad backs it up over there. And by the time he got, gets it about lined up and ready to set it up, she said, well, I think I want to go over there because Simone's parked over there. So he moved it again. He put it over there. <laughs> well, then somebody else came in, one of the other sisters. She said, but you know, there's a shade tree over there. <laughs> so he moves it the third time. The fourth time when she wants to move it, he pulls it up where the tree was at. And he backs it into it and he says, he hit the tree with it. He says, you're parked. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't move it no more, but he was moving it all over that place. <laughs> well, I remember this one time my Aunt Zepta, 
my father and my aunt Zefta were very close. And we were discussing this the other day. Like, my aunt Albertina was the oldest, and there was a big age difference between her and her siblings. And then my uncle Justino, my aunt Germana, and my aunt Esterina were real close. They were real close because they were in the same age. And then my father and her mother were very close. They were young than the other ones. The young, and then Simona was the youngest, and she, like she said, was left in Europe. But her mother, I remember, well, I don't remember buying this little green trailer. <laughs> My mom and dad. Did it have a crease in the back? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> their mom, they wrecked their trailer or something happened to their trailer. I don't know. But I remember we moved into this little. And it was little. I think it's as big as this couch. <laughs> it was a just a little, a, a little thing. And it was green. It was Dark green, like a hunter green. I was I green. Remember I remember green. And then one morning we heard goo -goo, goo -goo, goo -goo, all over this trailer. It was covered with frogs. Oh. It attracted every frog in Florida, I think. <laughs> and this little trailer that they had that went, I wonder if it's the one they ran into the tree. That's what I asked. Did it have a crease in the back? I don't remember. <laughs> And then I remember one time, I was still real small, when the family, I don't know if you remember this, the family had their circus. And our circus, well, ours, theirs, they took it to the Keys. Do you not remember that when they Tell took it? Tell me a little more. I don't remember They yet. took it to the Keys. Well, I can't remember all of it, but I remember coming back. We were coming back. Mm -hmm. And we were like in a hurricane, mm -hmm. and it had knocked down all the telephone poles were on that, across the bridge or you the road. You would remember that if you lived in Miami, yeah. going across it in the keys. And, 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 the, and those telephone poles had all fallen, mm -hmm. fallen onto, and I remember we were parked along the side of the road because we couldn't go any further because of the, the light poles and all the circus trucks were in a line and stuff. And... I guess they must have cut the lights off or I'd be electrocuted by now, but they used to have these blue things on the on the light poles. Conductors. These blue things mm -hmm. that were made out of glass. Mm -hmm. And I was picking on them all up. And then I remember that somebody went somewhere to get some food for everybody and they built like a bonfire or something and was cooking outside or something. That's how we ate till they got that cleared off. So I don't we remember. could leave. I don't, you know, I remember, don't remember that. that. I remember that. I might not have been there. Well, somebody was there. I, mean, I, wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't there by myself. <laughs> okay. Well, you're saying, yeah, you remember that. And then, oh, well, I might have not been there. <laughs> I don't remember it. Okay. All right. Was there, was there a point when the family decided to kind of go on their separate ways? And oh, kind not of split like it off? Okay, we left in 55, okay, and came here. But then when they went, when my grandfather died, they went back to the family and they took their circus to Cuba. Mm -hmm. They took the circus to Cuba. Then we came back in 15, well, whenever. Whenever we came back, we lost everything down there because of the revolution down there. They stayed in it a little bit longer, and in fact, my mother got with my uncle and they were going to do a writing act. And that and was in 59. That was in 59. And then after that, I think mother, she went to um, one other circus, and I can't think of the name of it, for a very short time. And then she got out of it. That's when she got out of it. And they all did that. They all started you know, splintering and going their own ways. Their own ways, except for my dad, and he stayed. But he did splinter. He came over oh, and yeah. did his thing. But, but, he, but we stayed in circus. But they stayed in circus. We stayed in right. circus. And how old were you, Dolly, when you said, okay, I'm, I'm ready to get out? I, when I got out of high school, when I, when I got married. Mm -hmm. I was 18 when I got married. I graduated when I was 17 and met my husband. And, and my mother and I sat down and talked about it. She understood. Which was a smart decision. Yeah, she understood. I said, you know, I love the circus. 
I don't always love the surface, but it's such, in most cases, it's such a short lived center ring type thing, unless you're extraordinarily good that after 10 or 15 years, you need some kind of a backup, you know? And that was my thoughts on it. You know, when, when you start out as a performer, you start out as a child, like Dolly. By the time she's 35, that's it. That's your lifespan? That's it. It is in that because you're gonna get hurt. You're going to, you know, and-, and your, 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 your bones and, your, and your, your shoulders wear out, the bones and a bareback rider usually loses his knees at a very young age. They tear out the cartilages or, or, or something. My cousin Timmy has had, I don't know how many surgeries on his knees where, where the cartilages or, or his kneecap or, or something, something with his knee. And I had been so fortunate that I never let it happen to me till I was going to practice one day. I was breaking a new horse. And the person I had had the lead on the horse that goes to their bridle. And they just hold it to keep the horse in the ring. And so um, he doesn't hurt himself hitting the ring curb. You keep him at a, a sh so far away from the ring curb till he learns to run it without hitting it himself. And I was vaulting off and on the horse. Well, normally you're supposed to, if you get on that side of the rope, it'll catch you if, as the horse is running, cause he's let go of it. Well, they did, they pulled it. And when they pulled it, it caught my leg and it tore the cartilage out of, out of my knee. I didn't do it on the horse. The person that was holding the rope did but, it. But that's true with horseback riding. With flyers, it's usually the shoulders. Their shoulders. Um, anybody that does trapeze, it's that their shoulders, shoulders their neck, mm -hmm. and, and and that type of thing. Um, people that do teeterboard, their back, their knees, their their uh, their neck. It's such a high impact part of your body that you use. Like and, and like the cannon, your knees and your mm -hmm. back. Let's see, I did the cannon for a little while, too. I even did that. See, I don't have any back problems because I didn't do any of that stuff. I had one knee problem. <laughs> and it wasn't because of the horse. It was because of the idiot that was holding that rope. Should have let go of it. <laughs> so a, a bareback rider could have a longer career. I think so. Yeah. More so than, than, uh, than a flyer. Than mm -hmm. a flyer. Yeah. Like, right, I got on the horse. It wasn't too long ago. But it scares my grandkids. Oh my God, you see, because I have a defibrillator. And they're so afraid I'm going to have a heart attack on this horse. Well, I mean, they're probably <clears throat> telling you right. You don't want to do yeah. that. So. But I got on that, on the DVD, I'm on the horse, guys. <laughs> we put our grandmother. Oh, yeah. They took her out one year. She was going to tell them, my mother and them had a horseback ride. It, I had gone to Florida. How old was she then? In her 70s? Oh, she was close to 80. Yeah. She, uh, and I had gone to Florida. Horse, and she did a round on that horse. Now, she didn't stand up. She sat on it. But she made a round on that horse and got off and turned around to all the kids and tell them that's how you do it. Yeah. <laughs> she, uh, I had taken my horses to Florida. I had to do something in Florida and, and it fell through and I never did. You know, and they had a big party and I think it was her birthday, I'm not sure what it was. <clears throat> and they brought my grandmother the thing, and sure enough, they put her up on this horse, poor Nonna. And she was she was up there, she was up on that horse, and did her little thing going around. See, see? <laughs> but um, she didn't perform, perform as a herself. When she was young. Yeah. When she was she young, was, yeah. She was very, very yeah. talented. Her and my grandfather worked together. Yeah, yeah. They was, um, that's why my great, great, great grandmother. We'll show you here in a minute. We've got a list that uh, shows you how far back it goes. So, uh, my son, I don't know how my son did. This has been several years. My son got on the computer 
and was trying to check back uh, the generations or something. And he found a cousin of ours that had splintered during Napoleon's reign that went to Germany. And um, and this cousin had, has done like 20, 20 years of research on the royal family and stuff and stuff. So, and so Dolly and we were discussing, oh, well, let's, we need to do this on the Travaglia, on my grandmother's side now, and see how many generations and what year there's, they're started in, in, in show business. But for me, I was, I consider myself a bareback rider. That's what I consider myself, a bareback rider. But I worked elephants, a trapeze, nothing like Dolly. Mine's a half-assed trapeze. Um, no, I, I, I just did a, a little routine and that was it. I never did anything like you. Um, I did web, I did swing and ladder. I've helped put up the tent, take down the tent, and you've done the same. I remember back when we were kids and the family had their circus. And um, we uh, had folding chairs, mm -hmm. red ones. We had I remember up. red I remember folding <laughs> chairs. And here I am, five, six years old, putting up those red folding chairs. We had red folding chairs up in the seats for the audience to sit in. Mm -hmm. And um, I've driven stakes. I've put up pony rides. I've taken down pony rides. I've If you uh, could walk... You pulled your load, <laughs> you know. Uh, did did just about everything, and did everything but play in the band. And if my grandfather could have got me to play that darn violin, I'd have probably been in the band too. And juggling, and I hated juggling. I hated it. My father was fantastic juggler, but I hated juggling. I doesn't do nothing for me. Still doesn't do nothing for me. I can juggle a little bit, just enough to say I can do a little bit. I I, I used to go ta da ta da ta da in the back, and that was it. Uh, the juggling. When Tina was little, my daughter, we used to put her in the riding act, and uh, she was about three years old, and I used to have her stand up at the front. Of course, she didn't do anything. She'd have her hand on her hip and she'd be going like this. And she'd come out one day just crying. And at the end, they'd run back and they'd get her, you know, off the ring curb because she'd stand there. And so she'd come out crying. I said, well, what's the matter, Tina? Why are you crying? She says, Mondo says I can't do Tootsie no more. Because I used to tell her to stand out there and do Tootsie, Tootsie, don't cry. <laughs> she'd come out. My mom says I can't do Tootsie no more. And that was her her debut in the circus doing Tootsie, and so. Uh, but uh, we did did everything. I'd sit out on the on the tent when we'd have blowdowns, like a storm would come, and it would blow it down. And my dad would sit out there. In fact, I got pictures somewhere, and he would sit out there and sew on it. And we'd sew, and I used to. I learned to do baseball stitches. That's how mm -hmm. we used to sit and sew on that old canvas baseball stitches, hours and hours. I remember and we used to make the, the, the nets for the flying act. We'd sit out there and put them together. The flying act nets, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, yeah. Uh, just... I think I, I still worked, make a mean net. I, I, <laughs> I, worked, I worked at set of llamas once. I'm going to tell you, don't ever work a llama act. Them suckers spit at you. You try to try to dodge those suckers. And I had four of them in that ring, and I'm trying to make them go around. Help, and they're and I'm dodging the spit. Cush, cush. Let me tell you. I'm, uh, she was more into the animals. Uh, I didn't have to feed my act. <laughs> and and my mother is real funny because, like I said, she didn't come from a circus family. She came from counters, excuse me. But she uh, she learned to work elephants. 
she learned to work chimpanzees. She had a bear act at one time and uh, worked in the riding act. She never did any aerial work, but she was pretty much, you know, the riding act, elephants, chimps. In fact, I used to get that chimpanzee's hand-me-down costumes. The chimpanzees, her name was Debbie, one of the chimps. Those are with some mean animals. And she loved my mother. That Debbie would love my mother. And he loved her to death. Anyway, Mama had this little chimp, one of the chimps that she worked on. Her name was Debbie. Well, when Debbie would outgrow the costume, I got the costume. You were a monkey. I wore the monkey's <laughs> And there was one. I didn't know that. Are you serious? <laughs> there was one. It was so pretty. It was Did pink. Did you throw your banana <laughs> It was it was pink and green. I'll never forget it. It had little white out. It had little white pearls on What'd it. What'd you do about the back? It was no, no, it was closed up. Oh, okay. She wore diapers, <laughs> Dolly. They wore diapers back then. They didn't have pampers. They had diaper diapers. Y'all gonna be cutting that out of this, I hope. <laughs> but yeah, her name was Debbie. I remember Debbie. <laughs> Sorry. You didn't know about I didn't Debbie the Chimp. wearing a monkey's outfit. It wasn't a, a monkey's yeah. outfit. It was a costume, but a it was two piece. Yeah, it was two piece. Oh, God, that's so funny. <laughs> and I always got Debbie's hand me downs. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Lucy, do you remember the first time you met Dr. Dr. Miller? Mm -hmm. The first time I ever met Dr. Miller, I'm going to say he had to be in 1956 or the end of 55, beginning of 56, we came to Hugo. Okay. You know where the hospital is, right? Okay. And that glove factory right there, right? That they're turning into a boys and girls club. Okay. That was the end of the road right there. It was dirt road from, from the glove factory, the end of the hospital all the way down Kirk Road, past Kelly Miller, past Carson Barnes. That was all dirt road. And I remember coming into Oklahoma, crossing the Red River, and it was, the road was like going down Kirk Road back in the day, because none of that. Town ended. Well, that wasn't even in town. That was, uh, Okay, where Angie's restaurant is, okay, we were out in the country already. It was Angie's restaurant, but it wasn't Angie's, it was called Tyler's. And it had the old drive-ins, like the old drive-in where you pull up and they come to the car like an A&W, and it was called Tyler's. And then there was a big span to nothing, and then that little red building that's the bar, the Red Star, that was there. There was nothing beyond that. That, I mean, we were already in, out in the country. That the hospital was over here, and and the road went out, and you went by the hospital right there. A little road went there. Kentucky Fried Chicken, all of that. None of that stuff was there. That was all trees, all out in the country. And so, the end of the hospital, it began the dirt road, and. It was all dirt road all the way to winter quarters. And I don't know, I remember Mr. Miller coming up and then I remember him leaving. That was the first time I remember seeing him. And it wasn't, it was him and his father, Obert. And then they left. And then I don't know how much longer, when you're a little girl, you know, and it seems like time is forever. Uh, here come Klein, sitting on an elephant. Um, this is the elephant, and he's sitting like one foot here, and this one over the ear like that. And he's right, come riding up on the elephant. And uh, got off, hooked that elephant. Tina, made Tina turn around, hooked her up climbed back up on her head, and he pulled us from there all the way to winter quarters because it had snowed here, and it was all mushy and nasty, and 
and you couldn't go down the road. You'd get stuck, you'd go off the road. And uh, they pulled us, truck and trailer, or car and trailer, I should say, from there all the way to winter quarters. And then DR was there to park, park us, showed us, park my mom and dad. And uh, that was the first time I'd ever seen Mr. Miller. But um, later in years, not that many later in years, but later in years, he uh, paddled my butt several times. I didn't know he did that. Oh, yes, ma'am. Not only did he get me, he got my brother. I could see him getting your brother, though. But, you know, one of the things, and I don't know if you remember this when you're growing up on this, you're never supposed to hang on the guy lines. I know that. I was always hanging on the guy lines. I was always playing wire or something on those guy lines, <laughs> trying to walk up like Z Albertina mm -hmm. on those guy lines, always. And I was hanging there. And you'd be hanging, but you'd be hanging like crooked, mm -hmm. you know? And he'd come up and let me tell you, get off the guy lines and bow. <laughs> and so, and then my brother had a bad habit of going under the seats. Another thing. Didn't watch you under the seats because you could hit one of those jacks right. and it could make, you know. He ball. was going to sit looking for change. I bet you. Oh, no, we were looking for candy. You remember candy? them candies yeah. that used to come in those boxes and they were like caffy and they'd be rolled. Cracker Jack? Not the Cracker Jacks. Yeah. They had caffy. Oh, they was, actually had taffy in there. Yeah, I do. Yeah, do you it remember? had the plastic. That little thing. paper rolled around it. Yeah. And then they had little prizes in there. Mm -hmm. And we were always looking for those things that you put your finger in and yeah. you could pull them. Mm -hmm. And stuff. Anyway. Chinese handcuffs. Well, I don't know what the heck they were called. And then they had those little glasses. That's what came in the Cracker Jack. Those little glass, those little round things that you could hold. And if you hold it in the sun and hold it over the thing, you could get a little fire started. Quit making fun. That's where I got my first driver's license. Out of a Cracker Jack box? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> But, yeah, my brother would always go under the seats. Always. Mr. Miller just happened to catch him. Oh, wow. Let me tell you. He was something else. My brother was something else. Back in the day, they had what they called banners. And a representative of the circus would want to make extra money. I guess that's how it worked. And <coughs> they would go into town. And they would go to the city merchants. And they would go to the grocery store, the hardware store, wherever, feed store, and um, would sell them banners. Okay, we're going to make banners. I don't know how much they charge, $25. I guess they charged by the size of the banner you wanted. Anywhere probably from $10 on up. And so they would come back with a list of these different merchants. And they had, the, they had this trailer, and they had paint in the back of this trailer, and they would have these big, long, white sheets of paper mm -hmm. that came on a roll, and they'd cut them, mm -hmm. and they would, with this paint, would put on their so-and-so's garage or so-and-so's grocery store. And then they would take them in the tent, and they had clothespins, and they had, like, laundry lines, mm -hmm. and they had those things on them, and they'd drop them down, and they'd snap them on there. And then they'd pull them up and they'd be all around the tent. like advertisement. Advertisement for these different merchants. Mm -hmm. Well, needless to say, my my brother found the back end of that that paint truck, that that trailer that had the paint. He painted the whole inside of that trailer. He painted the horses that were tied outside that trailer. Calvin Miller's trailer is who it was. I painted them horses, feet, red, blue, pink, whatever color they had. I mean, he painted everything. And then he had paint all of They wanted to know who got in the yeah, paint. He probably, not, he did not, me, it, not me. Not me. <laughs> he, had, he had paint all over him. Well, I tell you what, Mr. Miller and, uh, and Calvin Miller both got him. And then another time, Freddie Logan, that I'm telling you about, whose son... Uh, they had their trailer parked there. And my brother was always in trouble. Always. And he uh, was a little kid. His dad worked chimps. And his name was Bob Mox. I can't remember what the little kid's name was. But anyway, 
they had crawled underneath Freddie's trailer and it was windy and they were going to have a weenie roast, but the wind kept blowing the fire out. So they got this fire started under Freddie Logan's oh, trailer. No. And set the whole back <laughs> end of the trailer on fire because they were sitting there weenie roasting under this trailer. But they were, and that would happen out here at the circus out at Carton and Barnes back in the day. But I'll tell you what, and the old barn where I practice now, these Appaloosa horses, I practiced in that barn. My kids practiced in that barn. Your dad practiced in that barn. My dad and your mother. Mm -hmm. I remember And that. my grandkids are practicing in that barn. If that barn could talk, just imagine the stories it could tell us. Because there's no telling how many people before us practiced in that ring barn. It's ready to fall, but still. And where is the barn? I'll have to take you. Before you leave, I'll take you up there and show you the old Algie Kelly Miller winter quarters and uh, Carson and Barnes' first winter quarters is out of town. Uh, I, I, when you come in, what, you come from off the turnpike, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right where the turnpike is, where you get off to come into Hugo and you go under and you come and I don't know if you notice there's a veterinarian office over that way. Okay. And the sale barn. Okay. Well, the sale barn sits right here, and there's a road that runs along the sale barn. Well, on this side of the sale barn, there's still the house is still there. There's a house on that corner, and that's the original Carson and Barn Circus Winter Quarters. Y'all need to still see that. Mm -hmm. yeah. The original. I'd like to get some pictures of that. I mean, it's just a house that you know, but still. that's that was the original Carson and Barn's Winter Quarters. And, and who the owner of the circus was back then was Jack Moore, Jack Moore. And then when Jack Moore, of course, him and Mr. Miller and them, I don't know how later on they were in partner together. Uh, it's, uh, this is my understanding of, of how uh, Jack Moore, and I believe a man by the name of Franco Richards opened Carson and Barnes up. And it was just, I'm not sure if Mr. Miller had invested in it or not. I don't know. I couldn't tell you. And then um, later in years, um, I'm trying to think, 1960, 63. 1963, we went on Carson and Barnes because up till then we were still on Algie Kelly Miller Circus, which was by Mr. Miller. And then in 63, we went to Carson. Carson and Barnes, and who was owned by Jack Moore and his wife at the time. Then 64 went back to Algie Kelly Miller, and then in 65 went back to Carson and Barnes, and then stayed on Carson and Barnes. And then the year, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say 69, 68, in 68, I was in Florida for some reason that winter. I don't know why. Oh, I do know why. I'm sorry, I'm lying. Went to Sarasota. I was supposed to... <laughs> Zio Justino was the equestrian director and ringmaster of... or performance director of Ringling Brothers. Mm -hmm. They were in Venice, Florida. They were no longer in Sarasota. They were in Venice. And so... Uh, winded up, it was me and Papa and Zio Justino winded up going to Venice. Well, Zio had to go anyway because he had to be there every day. But they wanted me to go and I was supposed to work for the Christiansons in their writing act. So everything was getting set up for me to go on the Ringling Show. And Papa was supposed to do something. I can't remember what it was. But then we got went back to Zia's house and stuff and they got a phone call from Jack Moore and this was this was like towards the middle or first part of February and uh, they got a phone call from Jack Moore and he was having a lot of problems and he was in the hospital and he got on the phone to Papa and he told Papa he says 
I understand you're going to the Ringling Show. You're taking Lucy and this and this and that. And he says, you know, Alfonso, I was really counting on you. He says, because I know you know I'm sick and uh, I'm not doing too good. He says, but, and Mr. Miller's going to, I'm going to back up a little bit. By then, Algie Kelly Miller had gone broke. What happened was he winded up selling, there was some problems, and he winded up selling Algie Kelly Miller to a man by the name of Joe McMahon, Mr. Miller did. And, and the show went broke. And uh, so then uh, Jack Moore said, DR is coming on the show. He is going to be my manager and this and that and the other. And he says, because, you know, he's going to take over the duties. He says, but everything will stay the same. He says, I really need you to be there. He says, you know how it, everything works to help him out. And I'm really counting on Lucy and blah, blah, blah. Make a long story short, I didn't go to the Ringling show. We came back to Carson Barnes, and it was 1969. And uh, he died two weeks before before we went out. And so, but we went ahead and went with Carson Barnes. And then in 69, and uh, we were still, it was we. I always say we because... To me, that's like my home. So, uh, it was a three ring circus still. And I remember we were in the Chicago, going into Chicago, and that was the first year. And DR uh, made it a five ring circus. He had gotten, he had gotten uh, two more middle pieces and more poles and made it five ring. And it was the most beautiful circus I'd ever seen. And it was at Maywood Park. And the police was our sponsor. <clears throat> and they had brought truckloads of sawdust. And I mean, it was it was absolutely gorgeous. All this sawdust and, and the lighting and, and uh, he had uh, hired extra acts to come in. He hired, uh, a young man by the name of Martin Luentini, which your mom and them knew the family because they used to do a hand balancing and tumbling mm -hmm. act. And then he hired a family, or he hired a bunch of girls called the Cassidy Girls, and they did aerial acts. And then he had hired some other acts. But, um, and then from there is where Carson Barnes grew its five rings. And he had worked, God, we did Wheaton, Wheeling, Oak Brook, we had, uh, it was absolutely gorgeous, it was like a month of just in the Chicago area. And then when we left the Chicago, it went back to three rings, but then the following year, 1970, it was five rings all the whole, the whole year. And of course, then we went back to Maywood. We went back to Maywood several years. And, uh, and then I'd been on Karsten Barnes. DR bought Karsten Barnes from Angela and Hank Hoover or something. I believe in 1970 it became his. That's the story that I know of like that. But, <clears throat> but, um, but Mr. Miller seems like we were with him forever. You know, Barbara, Barbara and I grew up together and, uh, we, uh, I used to be so mean to poor Barbara. I remember chasing her with a stick with a nail in it. And oh, my gosh. <laughs> I, was, I was real hateful. I, just, I think about things now, you know. And Barbara, in her own right, was a very good little performer. She uh, did a bounding rope, and she did manage, and uh, elephants, and uh, she, was, she was very talented. She was very talented on the bounding rope. And uh, I remember her practicing with a, doing tumbling and stuff with a, a Mexican family. And the man, his name was Maurice, Maurice Mamalejo. Mm -hmm. But uh, then we go back a little. When, you know, when we're on the circus as young kids, even though they're not related to us, they're our aunts and our uncles. The Aunt Jerry, Aunt Flo, Aunt so-and-so, Uncle Dory, Aunt Isla. 
And um, even though, you know, we're not related, but to us, we feel like... like it's like a sign of respect. Like, like Maura to me. Maura is like my little sister to me. I've known Maura. I knew Maura before Maura even knew Maura. <laughs> I knew Maura when Maura was on her way. <laughs> but, um, and I've always been around Maura. In fact, Maura and I saved my cousin a couple of times, I think. <laughs> How long were you on Carson and Barton's? Do I want to come by, or do you want to say with Mr. Miller, or do I want to say? In total. In total. Mm -hmm. but, oh, goodness. I'm going to say 42 years, 43 years. And then I left, and then I'm back. I'm not on the road with them, but I'm still involved with them. So I, I don't know how you want to want to use that. But I'm I'm going to be 62 in in uh, July next month. When did you stop performing yourself? When I started performing, I think I was probably five. When did you stop? Oh, stop. stop. Oh, I'm sorry. God, let's see. 97. Two thousand one. When did the I towers? The towers. It's when the towers. Oh, two thousand one. You talking about September, September 11th? eleven? September eleven, twenty yeah. twenty one. That, that's the last year. That's the last year I performed. No. Yeah, a complete season. Mm -hmm. Then, I did a date or two for my son, the comedy, and that was it. Like in ninety eight. Uh, not 98, but like 2002 or something, and that was that was it. And even though you were you're still probably training horses and doing all kinds of things, what were your reasoning, what was your reasoning behind not performing anymore? My defibrillator. Mm -hmm. That, I mean, if, if I had a good heart, I wouldn't be sitting here. My butt would be on the road. It would um, be performing. If they would let me, <laughs> but I'm, I don't think I'd look very pretty in a costume anymore. But no, I did comedy there at the last. I um, I did a comedy act in the writing act. I don't know if you'd ever seen it or not. It was on Funniest Home Videos one year. It's pretty they, good. Uh, I had a ball when I had, and it was really hard for me to do it because I'm so used to riding the right way that you have to ride like you don't know how to ride. And I know how to ride, so it's really hard to not, to do like you're not trying to ride. But um, I'll look for some videos of me doing the comedy and and uh, let you have some. Yeah, that'd be great to see. Yeah. And uh, uh, I don't know, and it seems, I, to me, it seems like I've always worked forever in the circus. I don't remember not working in the circus, except when we come home in the winter time, and then I practice and sewed. I'd go out and sew all winter out at the circus, out at, in the basement or across the street in the sewing room. I was always doing something with the circus, practicing elephants, practicing the writing act or, or something. I wish we'd have uh, filmed you when you, that, that, um, that day that, uh, you got on the flying rod. Oh, that's right. And, and uh, the day that, um, oh, again. the day that, uh, Dolly got on the flying act. And that was in the 80s, Dolly. I was in my 30s. I remember that. That, it was in the 80s. I'm going to, I'm going to stop and I'm going to try to think what year it was in. 84. Five, baby. Wait a minute. Maybe I was in my forties. Keep going up. Wait, wait, no, 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 no. Wasn't eighty-five. I've got to go back. No, I didn't have Tina yet. It was, it was like seventy-nine. Okay. It was like seventy-nine, seventy-eight. It was either seventy-eight or seventy-nine. And um, Alfredo Morris, ex-husband. It was his family's flying act. And nobody knew Dolly. Everybody knew Dolly's mother. Oh, this is my Aunt Zefta's daughter, Dolly. Oh, yeah, I heard about your mother. Oh, I've seen your mother. 
I seen pictures of them. I've seen videos of your mother. And um, I said, well, you know, she used to fly. Oh, yeah? It was like one of those. Oh, yeah? So anyway, she got up there, and boy, and their mouth went. They go, oh, my God, what style? Que estilo. Que estilo tiene. Mira que estilo tiene. And uh, I said, yes, I can thank my grandfather for the estilo she's got, her style of flying. But, um, uh, and then, like she said, she was so sore the next day that she couldn't. I can remember that like it was yesterday, trying to get out of that bed, make it to the bathroom, get ready to go to work. I was so miserable. When when Dolly came came on uh, Algy Kelly Miller, because it wasn't Carson Barnes, it was Algy Kelly Miller, when her and my Aunt Zefta came, and there was a lady who did trapeze on the circus, but she wore shoes with gimmicks, and she had a net underneath her. And then she was coming to do an audition for Mr. Miller. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so they told the lady she wasn't working that day. I remember it like it was yesterday. And they told her she wasn't going to perform that day, that they had a young lady come in to do an audition, and they wanted to do it during the performance so they could watch her work. So they put up the trapeze for Dolly, and of course there's no net. There's no mechanic. And she's all of, what, 11? Eleven, something like that. Yeah. And she comes in to work, and of course, her father and my father are there to watch her, you know, to make sure. And she goes up, no tights, no nothing, just her little costume on, and does her toes and her flying heel catches and everything. And and Dior goes, yeah, okay, we're yeah. Oh boy, talk about somebody getting upset. Yeah, There's was, always a lot of competition in the circus, and so. And here's this little 11 year old doing it with no gimmicks, no net underneath her. And uh, you gotta understand that woman was trying to make a living. Yeah. All I was doing was showing off. And she was taking her job <laughs> away from her. <laughs> but <laughs> that was funny. It was not funny when you think about when you're older, but back yeah. then I thought, oh, I do that, you know. Yeah, I said, hey, I do that. Let, show you how it's, let me show you how it's really done. She goes, Lucy, I do that without <laughs> shoes. I said, I know. <laughs> I said, she has to wear gimmicks. <laughs> God, kids are terrible, aren't they? We were awful. Oh, well, I'm better than she is at that. <laughs> we're kids. We're terrible. But, um, I don't know. And, uh, are there parts that you miss looking back, Dolly? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. If I had it to do over again, I probably would have done it a little bit different. I don't think I'd have given up all my circus roots and gotten out of it like I did. But like I said back then, it was just like I was running away from it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I do. You know, we were, we were talking, and I don't know if you noticed this with Maura and, and them, how Maura, too, her family is right there. Her her kids, her daughter, her grandkids, and, 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 uh, and stuff. And we were discussing this. And that's my cousin, my other cousin in Florida, too, we were discussing this. She says, you know, Lucy, it's really incredible how you kept the family tradition alive. Basically, like my father and his sister and the others, they all lived right there together. And that's how I am, my kids, except for Tina. She's the only one that wanders off every now and then because her husband's in the military, but um, they always say when they re when he retires, he's gonna be close to home, you know. So, and which I understand, you know, they get moved here and get moved there and and everywhere. But then, like my daughter Josie, she's here. My son Armando, he's here. My grandkids on both sides are here. My daughter Mona comes home and stays here and stays quite a while and then when it's time for her to go work then she'll leave but her daughter's here with me ever since she was little well ever since my mom passed away because my mom used to send all of my kids to school and started off i kind of took her place pretty much you know 
I've tried both ends of the, of the stick. I've done circus, and I have gone into what you call the towner's line. And no matter what, it's in your blood, it's, 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 it's your roots, it's your, your history. And how many people can talk about that? Very few. We can all talk about growing up at different things like that. But the history of the circus, it's, it's a rarity. It really is. So yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's part of our upbringing and we'll never forget it. You know, a lot of times people will ask me, oh, well, do you think the circus is dying? I don't think the circus is done. I don't think it'll ever die. There'll always be a circus, some way, some form. Maybe not a big circus like Ringling Brothers or, or like Carson and Barnes used to be all five rings. But I always think there will be a small branch of a circus, even if it is just a ring and a small family doing with one trailer or what we would call a dog and pony show. But I always believe that there will be a, a little circus. I don't think it'll ever die. I really don't. Do you think there's something unique about the the canvas tent? You know, Ringling performs in large cities, big arenas. There's a big difference. A huge difference. A big difference. Big, the smell, I don't know what it is. The grounds, the smell, the, I can tell the difference of working in a, in a, in a building and, and working Given to me, I'd rather be on a mud show than, a, than in a building. The only good thing about a building is when it's hot, you got air conditioning. When it's cold, you got heat. And don't forget the showers. Oh, the, well, no, well, no, I bring my own bucket. <laughs> she has a gallon. She got her gallon of bucket. I'm, I want to show you something, darling. I'll be right back. You can continue the, the conversation. Oh, where are you going? Right here to get something. <laughs> She's gonna bring a bucket out here. You watch. That that'd be. Awesome. I just want to see that costume. I really want to see that costume. <laughs> well, I wanted to know why you decided law enforcement. Oh wow. Well, my husband, my, my kids, daddy, and I uh, separated, and I went back to Florida, and I really needed to go to work. So there's, there was an opening. As a dispatcher at the sheriff's office. And she hadn't done trapeze in a while. <laughs> and so I started working as a dispatcher there. And then when I came back, we tried to work things out. I came back to Texas and started working. We separated again and I stayed. And I started working as a dispatcher. And then I went to the police department there in Henderson and dispatched there for a while. And I walked into the, sh the chief's office one day and I said, I need to make more money. I need to go on the streets because I mean I was struggling to try to raise my kids. And he said, Well, I'm not gonna have a woman on the streets. And I says, I really, really need to make more money. And so about two weeks rolled by and he called me in there one day and he said, Are you serious? And will you stay if I pay to send you to school? I said, Absolutely. My kids are here. I won't be leaving. So he sent me to school. I went into patrol and did that for twelve years and then I they put me in as a detective. And I did that till I retired. So, and that's where I met my current husband. Hmm. So law enforcement, so. It was a necessity. Mm -hmm. And I liked it. Don't get me wrong, I really liked it, but it's not the same as circus. Okay, we were discussing. If, um, if you bring a tub Well, out. no, I didn't oh, I bring what a, you're putting I didn't there. bring a tub. <laughs> <laughs> I said you said um don't forget the showers. Well, is, if it's hot, you got cold water. I, I if it. it's cold and you got lights, you got hot water. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, yes. that's how you heat the water up. <laughs> well, they didn't have these really. Actually, this back is then my, they used to set them in the sun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this water. is this is what I used for my horses when they were, you know, the water freezes in their water barrels. I just mm. run enough light cord to to keep it from freezing, but you have to pull it out or unplug it because. But um, then I go, hey, yeah, we can use these to heat water up. Plug it in the bucket and, you know, and have hot water. But, uh, so. <laughs> well, how's life different? You know, on the road, I'm sure you don't have to practice a lot. You do and you don't. It just depends on what you do. Mm -hmm. If you're a juggler, you practice all the time, whether you perform in the show or not. 
the minute the show's over and the people are out of the tent, he's in there practicing. A juggler practices 24-7. Um, depends, like the flying act. They like to practice all the time. Uh, I didn't like to practice all the time. <laughs> You'll also see them working a lot when they're not performing to do something new to put in the act. Uh -huh, You'll see them uh -huh. going in and trying to come up with something new to add on to that act. Or if they and, want to learn a new trick. Mm -hmm. or, or, or they have a new uh, performer uh -huh. that work with that person. So at the end of the season, when everybody returns to winter quarters or goes their separate ways, uh -huh. uh, what's happening during that time? A lot of practice, make new costumes for the next year. Uh, a lot of them have winter dates. Well, they don't have them so much anymore, but they used to have a lot of winter dates. They would close and they would go on and go, for an example, I'm going to give you an example. They have uh, what is called uh, in, uh, oh gosh, it's in Indiana, Evansville, Evansville, Indiana. They have a big uh, Paul Kay's dates. It's a big date. It's one of the biggest dates and it's in, I believe, November, in right. November. And then they also have one in New Orleans. The Hannaford date does New Orleans. And then they, um, I think those are about the last two dates till after Christmas. And then in January, um, February, they start up again and they'll have like, uh, I'm trying to think, Binghamton, New York. And uh, they go to, I can't ever say this, Tim. Kipsy, to Kipsy, New York, or something like that. Poughkeepsie. Uh, what is it? Poughkeepsie. Okay, wherever. And then they have like Memphis, Memphis. They have a big date in Memphis, Saginaw, Michigan, Detroit. They had. They used to have a lot of big dates. Um, anymore, I'm not real sure of of all the dates. Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, uh, let me think. Atlanta, they, you know, but like Ringling has pretty much all those big cities uh, sewn up and, and they don't I, go in there. I, I remember that when the family would come in, and most of the times they'd come in around the first part of November. Now, they weren't necessarily still working with the, sh the show at the time. They might be doing some dates, but when they came in in November, they did not practice until after January because there was Thanksgiving and Christmas and they really enjoyed those dates. But as soon as Christmas and New Year's was over with, they were either practicing or they were out on a date. Uh, uh, working. Even if they weren't with the show they were going to be with for the season, they would find some dates to make money through the winter. If they didn't, they would be practicing. But that's but like, they rested that, that short period. It was like a month and a half yeah, or so. They yeah. did take a break. They usually, like, it's really hard for the people with the animals, though, that have elephants yeah. and the lions and stuff for them to to uh, take a break because they have to, I don't know. I, they animals to, forget. to keep them sharp mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that. And, like, I remember Harry Rooks when I was a little girl. He would practice the Liberty Horses every day. There was three rings of Liberty Horses, and there were six horses in each act. So he would have to go through that whole act. I don't know how many times he'd go through the act. And then he'd practice the next group. And then, and, but it was like an all-day thing. And then he did the ponies and stuff. They mm -hmm. they would come home after on mm -hmm. the road. Mm -hmm. And the only day he didn't practice was Sunday. That was the only day he didn't practice. The elephants were the same thing. Right now, when Tim Frisco and, and them guys come home, that they're home. In fact, Ben's up there now. Um, he has his elephants or the elephants that he takes, he practices every day in the morning to just keep their mind alert on, on their thing. It's the same routine over and over, but it, it's to keep them alert, you know. Consistency, like what I was telling you about practicing or teaching a horse, it's consistency, keeping the same thing up over and over and over. And, uh, but yeah, but like a lot of the performers, they just um, come home, till after New Year's and then I know like we would start practicing but I would sew I would go I it would start after after New Year's go to the big house or the sewing room or the basement 
and sit and sew on, make new costumes for the for the next year. Have Have you not been over to the old wardrobe? I will have to take you. You'll have to bring your camera. Mm -hmm. I'll show you where we made wardrobe, where Carson Barnes makes all its wardrobe, and um, show you all the costumes hanging up and and stuff that um, that are still there that they use at times and different things. Yeah. Really. And who taught you how to sew? Myself. My mother, really. I watched my mother sit and sew. Um, I remember she used to get we this. We all did the costumes. Yeah, she'd get socks, you know, with the socks and learn to mend everything. And, mm -hmm. and so my mother couldn't make anything. She always, <laughs> it was already made, and she would put the stuff on it. And I remember she would have somebody make my costumes, but Mama would put the stuff on it. Now, the only time Mama did make a costume, and I'll never forget it, she'd go to a secondhand store, and she'd buy somebody's old evening gown, you know, that had the tutu that went all the way like a prom dress. Are we done? No, it's doing something funny. She would go to, like, the secondhand store, it'd be somebody's old prom dress or something, and she would whack it off, whack it off and hem it, I'm saying it was too big, she would take it up for me on the sides and stuff and put the sequins and stuff on My it. mother used to make all my costumes. She made this one costume. I remember costume. I got one of your mothers. She made me a costume, she a made, blue one. She made me this one costume that was completely covered in beads and sequins. I mean, there wasn't a spot on it. The problem was it was kind of heavy. And I, I almost lost the costume out there in one of my tricks, The one of the... Straps. When the straps broke and I just knew I was going to really put on a show out there because it was at Sailor Circus. The problem was it was so heavy that it was I was having a hard time with the heel catching tricks because I took that costume and weigh it was heavy. And, you know, we had to have a talk about that. She kind of lightened up on it, but it was absolutely the prettiest costume I ever had. It was gorgeous. Your mom made me a costume. It's all was, black sequins. She was, she loved doing it and she was good at it. And she taught me. She, her mama taught her, and we we bought the costumes. Mm -hmm. But that costume. But to cut out the costumes and stuff, um, what I would do is like I would go to a secondhand store, garage sale, and there'd be a bathing suit or a leotard, and I liked the way it was made or whatever. If it was a bathing suit, I would take it apart and I would use it as a pattern, and and make my own. And then if there was a leotard just that they use at ballet to practice in or to practice their dancing, I would take it and I would get a piece of chalk and I would draw on it what I'd want to cut out and how I'd want to. And so I'd cut out the holes or I'd make, cut the back out of it or something and then take it apart and use it as a pattern. And that's how I taught myself. So now I know the material for yeah. the front has to go up this way, for the back it has to go this way. and. Back years ago, the costumes now are pretty skimpy. They're, but I'll tell you another well, thing, too. The costumes her mother made wasn't stretch material. They didn't have stretch material back then. She had to have the measurements, your exact measurements. Now, this is stretch material. All I do is cut it out, and it stretches any way you want it. But back, back then, you weren't allowed to... Um, wear those kind of costumes. It was not thought the proper thing to wear. So what they would do is they would get this netting that was skin color. And then they would make the costume, but this up through here was not your, you didn't see your skin, it was skin color material. And then of course then, you know, she would fix it to where you'd have some movement and everything. But now the costumes really are just a lot skippier. But back then, you weren't allowed to do that. It's just like when I worked. I was not, when I was little, I was not allowed to work without a net because there were laws, you know, right here. So you had to be 16 to work without a net. Mm -hmm. So we'd have sitters underneath us or somebody, you know? But times have changed a lot. They really have. Like right said. here. Really? And where would you find the fabric? She would do just kind of like what Lucy was saying. She would find a, uh, like a bathing suit or something and she would measure me, and then she would take off whatever she needed to take off of that to make it fit just me. It wouldn't fit anybody else. And she would fix that costume, 
And then she would get material that she liked that had designs on it. And she would make the costume by using that pattern out of the material that she wanted the costume made out of. And then on where the designs were at, she put all the sequins on that. And, uh, and this is a costume a that. that belonged to my aunt. One of See my this? aunts. This is what I was talking about. See this? Mm -hmm. That's what they would do. The Ringling Show made this for my, hmm. my aunt. This is one of their costumes. I have one more over at the other house, the old house. This one was a yellow one. Well, anyway, I got to wear this back in the day when it fit me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it didn't stretch like they have the stretch material now. They had to know your measurements. That's like my aunt would measure. I There'd be no way. I couldn't. For me to sew one like this, I couldn't do it because I'm not that good of a seamstress. I could, I wouldn't know how to do it. But the stretch material, hey, it's nothing. It, this way, that way, and I can do that. But there'd be no way I could make a costume like this. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the Ringling Show made this, made these costumes for the family back in the day. And if I'm not mistaken, I told Dolly, I said, well, I think this one belonged to my Aunt Estorina. I said, I could have told you had I not washed it, and I washed the name off, and but I believe this was hers, uh, one of the costumes that they made them in 1932 when they came to the to the states. But um, I got a few of their costumes. I got to wear. I got to wear. I have one in a picture over there. They I used to call it the blue one with the the winter costume because they had white fur, not fur, but marabou around the bottom. And then there was one they called the velvet. I loved that red velvet costume. Mm -hmm. I loved it. And uh, I remember that costume. In fact, the mama's got it all in one of those pictures. In one of those pictures. In fact, I'm wearing it in one of my pictures. Here? I have to show. No, no. That that one belonged to the the family too when they were on the Ringling Show. It was rhinestones and blue on it. But uh, I remember then. Mr. Miller's family, Algie Kelly Miller, bought a whole bunch of costumes that belonged to the family <clears throat> after. And you remember the yellow can can well they weren't, they were green and yellow. Mm -hmm. The can can outfits and all of them. They bought all of those. They had all of those mm -hmm. costumes one year. The family wore a lot of feathers, uh -huh. uh, head pieces. But when they took this great big huge headpiece off, there'd be a small one, and it had like a small bunch of feathers on it. But it was so elegant when they walked out there with those big capes and, and those feathers and everything, and then they'd take the cape off and hand that feather back to whoever was taking it. I asked Dolly if she remembers this. Dolly, do you remember the shoulder pad things mm -hmm. that they wore under the cape? Those mm -hmm. big, yes, I did. big metal yes. things that made the, the... Why are you aging me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I said, do you... Do you, I said, do you remember I them? Do, I do. I remember them. Thank goodness. Okay. You know, those big metal things. My gosh, they were heavy. I remember those costumes and those metal things. The capes, they sent them all to my mom and dad for them to use them. Mama took them to the Goodwill. Gosh, she I wish. She did not. Oh, yes, she oh. did. I wished I had them now. Believe me. What about shoes? Had what we call pumps. Mm -hmm. They were special made. They were made in a place in New York called Griffin's. And I still have the address and stuff somewhere in that state. Now, my mama's pumps are buried with her. That and her and her whip is buried with her. She's buried over here. They used to have... She asked if we would put that in with her. Now, yeah. there was one problem. I couldn't find... Oh, her whip's buried with her. Her pumps are not. I couldn't find her pumps. And I just panicked. And after we had her buried, I went back home and we were trying to get things ready to, to sell and move out of there. I found her pumps, but it was too late. So I had one pump and Gina had one pump, my sister, and I finally gave her the other one because I thought they needed to be together so she's got them. We, I, we couldn't put them in with her and I, I was real upset about that. But she said, put my pumps and my whip in there, but we did put her whip in there. And so, not to change your subject, but Dolly brought a gift for my granddaughter Zefta. And it's a beautiful, well, 
it's aged now, but it's a trunk that my Aunt Zifta used to take all of the costumes and stuff in. And it wasn't too long. In fact, it's in, in the room right there. We're going to have it restored. It still so has her name on it. It has her name Part on it. it just still stuff. Stuff on there. Yeah. Um, I just I just figured that it needed to stay in show business and her namesake, you know, is still in show business. I'm not not gonna like that. I uh I only wished I could have been alive or born in their era because I think that was the heyday of, of circus to me. Mm -hmm. I mean it was it was. It was the heyday of circus. I would have I would have given anything to have been alive back then. There's a place in Sarasota. It's called Circus City Trailer Park. And anybody that was ever in show business lived in that trailer park. I mean, everybody lived in that trailer park. And so here in Hugo, we had a Circus City, well, it wasn't called Circus City Trailer Park, but we had a trailer park. And it's, you passed it every time you went to Maura's house. And it's, it's a uh, like a tow tow there's some like some little storage houses or something little storage thing units there and then there's like a I want to say a garage but it's not a garage it's like they have a wrecker there and they have cars that have been wrecked and stuff in there like a tow yard thing that used to be called the modern trailer park and all the show people used to live in that trailer park back then. We lived in that trailer park. Maura's mother, her grandmother, her grandfather lived in that trailer park. The Logans lived in that trailer park. The Zaners, the Rawls. Mary Rawls lived in that trailer park. So when you talk to Mary Rawls, say, Lucy wants to know, or do you, I'm sure she remembers, that I used to, we used to have catechism, study for catechism. Her, her, I think it was her father, her father Willie was our catechism teacher. And we all grew up in that trailer park. Mary Rawls, David Rawls, well not Mary, Mary was a mother, but her husband Harry, and they lived in the house, and David and Bobby and Margie and Susie and, and Chris and Michael and De uh, Kathy. Well, Kathy and Billy came way later. That's like Gina and Timmy. But we all, that was the modern trailer park. I don't know, did she ever mention that to you? Mm -hmm. Have her mention the modern trailer park to you. And the owner was Dorothy Turner. She was the owner of the trailer park. And she was an old show woman too. Her and her husband. You know, uh, Lucy, maybe we need to show them some photographs and stuff. Sure, sure. I'll let you get your book. Well, we'll show them some. Okay. Well, let's 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 ask you one more question. Sure. Um, let's see, Tanya. What's that question going to be? <laughs> you're like you're doing the you interview. You can ask whatever you um, want. We'll tell you. We're not shy. Oh yeah. Well, for for Lucy. You know, you could live anywhere. You know, you've been many, many places. Why do you decide to make Hugo your home? Okay, this is where my father and mother came to work for Mr. Miller and, and everything. Okay. And show, the circus is in Florida. I'm not saying we're dying out, but it, the family was different. They left, the, they left, Papa left, the family broke up and stuff, and we had work here, and they always wanted Papa back every year on, on, on uh, Kelly Miller, Carson Barnes, whatever. My brother and I went to school here, and uh, our work was here. Our work was here. Well, then later in years, We've often talked about going back to Florida and stuff. Then my brother was killed in an accident. Um, and he's buried here. And my mother said she would never leave 
Hugo now at all, ever. And we lived in the trailer park. We didn't own property or anything. And then after my brother died, we bought a piece of property and uh, had a mobile home put on it. And she said she would never leave Hugo because of my brother. And, you know, so this is home. I will, I will never, that's kind of, I don't know how to explain it. I'm going to start bawling here in a minute. I grew up with him, and then after, after my brother was killed, I knew I wouldn't even, I would never leave. And my mother and my father would never leave because of my brother. And so I just made Hugo my home. I, uh, I was married, divorced, he wanted me, well, he wanted me to leave and go with him. And there was 15 brothers and sisters in his family. And he, he's, he's in show business, they're from a circus family and, and stuff. And um, after my, like I said, after my brother left and he wanted us to, wanted me to leave and everything, go with him and his family and, and stuff. And I told him, no, I just said, if I'm going to take care of anybody's family, I'm going to take care of my family. I said, my mother and my father don't have anybody else but me. And I said, you're welcome to stay or you're welcome to go. I said, your mom and dad have 14 more brothers and sisters that can take care of them. And I said, and if you want to bring them along, they can come here and live with me, but I'm not going nowhere and, and I'm not going. And that's like, you know, uh, my brother's buried there next to my aunt Zefta. My father and my mother are sitting right here on the tea, on the mantel or on the whatever the bookshelf, I don't know what you call it, entertainment center. And they're not gonna go till I go. And when I go then they can go with me. And uh the kids were all laughing about it and they said, Well mom, Josie, she's kind of the funny one of the family. She says, Well mom, when you die we're gonna have you cremated and we're gonna set you up there and Josie's gonna say, Well no she ain't going, they're not going till I go. And she says, pretty soon we're going to have a whole collection, a whole collection of loyal sitting up there. Nope, we're not going till she goes or whatever. So, um, and you know what's going to be really fun, what's really funny is, you know, when we get tornado warnings being here in Oklahoma, those sirens go off and everything. One of us will grab the picture of my brother the other one will grab the other urn, one will grab the other urn, and they go with us. We go on vacation, they go with us. I don't leave them here. When I go to Florida, they go. When I go wherever, they go. And um, people will say, ah, I was at the cemetery, Lizzie. Couldn't find your mom and dad. I said, oh, no, they're here. They look at me. They just took a trip to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> they look at me like I'm crazy. They said, what? I said, yeah, they're they're they're, they're at the house. They're at the house watching TV. <laughs> <laughs> what? I said, well, I leave the TV on. My dad loved Western movies, so I leave the TV on. They always had the TV on, so I always leave the TV on. And uh, I said, no, they're there at home. They're they look at me like I'm. I said, but they're in their urns. And so uh, a lot of the kids. Sometimes the kids go, hey, did you hear that? <laughs> One of the grandkids would go, yeah, that was Nene rushing through the house. Didn't you hear her yell at you to shut up? <laughs> but, uh, no, I don't know. There's not much to Hugo, but it's my home. And uh, I will never leave Hugo. And You know, I can talk bad about it, say how ugly it is or whatever, but nobody else better. And uh, um, like I... Then, you know, I went to school with everybody here in Hugo. I know everybody in Hugo. Everybody knows me. I was getting my kids a haircut one day. My grandkids, not my kids, but my grandkids, before they went to Florida for a summer vacation. And uh, sitting up at the barber shop, and it's full of people. And there's this old man sitting over there staring at me. 
And I said, oh, gosh, don't let him be putting the make on me, please. <laughs> I'm past that. And he goes, I know you. And I said, oh, yeah, okay. And I'm like, was he one of my boyfriends when I was in school or something? And he goes, yeah. He says, I know you. I said, you do? He said, yeah, your dad's that little, your dad was that little teeny skinny Italian man that used to walk them horses out to the circus every year. And I said, yeah. And he said, and when the circus would come home, he'd walk them home every year. And I said, yeah. And he said, and you were right there with him, arguing all the way, <laughs> all the way home. He said, what's your name again? And I said, Lucy Loyal. He said, that's right, Lucy Loyal. I knew I knew you. But yeah, a lot of people would come up and say, yeah, I know you. <laughs> they only know me because my horses are the only ones that get, get loose. What, <laughs> they escape. <laughs> what's funny is my dad, my dad, our horses would get loose. And then my brother would be in school, up at high school. And they, Joe, your dad's horses are loose. And there would go my brother with his football buddies and catch the horses and bring them back. And there'd be my dad. And then, then later on in years, my horses would get loose. <laughs> Armando, your mom's horses are loose. And there'd go Armando. Him and his kids would, his friends would jump in the back of the pickup and go down, because they were headed to, Carson Barn Circus, go down Kirk Road, and they'd be all in the back of the truck. His friends pick up, they bring the horses back. Now they call Armando, uh, Christian, your grandmother's horses are loose. <laughs> and so one day, wasn't too long ago, the phone rings and it's Zefta. I said, hey, Zeph, what's going on? She says, Granny, your horses are loose. <laughs> I said, you're in Florida. How the hell do you know? <laughs> she said, whatever her name, Stacy so-and-so called me and told me to, <laughs> called me and told me your horses are loose. So Gina and I had to go catch the horses and put them in. That's funny. <laughs> but yeah, everybody, everybody knows. Your horses. My horses are loose <laughs> or something. It's so funny. They know where to go. And sometimes I get, I'll get a call. <laughs> this wasn't too long ago. The dog catcher come. Lucy, <laughs> he's good. Your horses are loose. I said, my horses are loose. He goes, yeah. I said, they can't be loose. They're tied. He said, no, they're loose. They're right up here. And I went with him. And I looked at him. I said, finally once, those are not my horses. <laughs> I said, those horses belong to, to uh, oh, the man that's the chamber, uh, Mr. White. I said, those are Mr. White's horses. Those aren't mine. I don't have to run after them. I go home. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, everybody knows when the horses are loose, they call me. Well, Dolly, why was it important? Was it your mom's plan to, to be buried here in Hugo? or We had two choices. We could have buried her in Florida because we had a plot down. And she didn't want to go down there because Gina and I are both in Texas. She loves her brother. So she said, if I can't go back to Florida, I want to be buried with my brother. So we got her a plot up here. In fact, they had an extra plot and we got it from them. When, when uh, Mama bought the plot, she bought but four see, she, plots. She was intending to actually live up here. She really was. She was, like I said, she was mm -hmm. going to live in that. She wanted to buy that place where Maura is but, now and she got sick. But I couldn't I couldn't let that happen because I couldn't take care of her up here. Mm -hmm. And they were on the road and in and out and I told her, I said, Mama, you know, I know that's what you want to do. I said, but I I can't take care of you up there. You know, and Gina was down in Austin then and she certainly couldn't take care of me. She was working, had her kids at school and so I, I said, tell you what we'll do. Let me talk to my uncle and see if we can't get one of those plots. And uh, that's what we did. She, she's perfectly, she said, as long as I can be with her circus, you know. And plus she had worked some with the show up here too, so. It was, oh, every, she knew everybody. She here. knew it, and everybody. she came out here and everybody knew her. She, everybody knew her, she worked with all these people. Um, it's family. 
I used yeah. to bring her up here two or three times a year and have to rush back to go to work. And when I'd get her up here, you know, she really didn't want to come back home. She wanted to be around the circus and everything. And she'd have to come home for her treatments and stuff. And I said, you know, you And one of the things home. was, you know, I was sewing on costumes and stuff. She would sit up there and sew it on the costumes. And she would give me ideas. Hey, what, what if you do it like this? What if you put that on there? What if, you know, and, and, and stuff like that, which Zia was a lot of, lot of help. Lot but of her, help. her and, and uh, my uncle Alfonso were very, very close. And oh, they were funny. Oh gosh, they were funny sometimes. She had just gotten back from the hospital. Yeah. And <laughs> I, to, I brought her up here. To know this family, how they really were, it's, it's funny. It's, I want to say Kardashians, they have nothing on this family, let me tell you. She gets out of the hospital, Dolly brings her, she wants So I want to go see my brother. Okay, here we go. So they're sitting in there and they start arguing over her mother's name. You don't know your mother's name? Yes, I know my mother's name. Her name is Stella. No, her name is not Stella. Her name is Josephine. They're fighting over what her name. Her name is Stella Josephine. Stella, Stella was her first name. First name. They're fighting over the name. No, her name was Josephine. No, Stella. My mother. <laughs> now you got to understand. My mother is really shorter than I am. Okay? She's real. She's real really little. Short. Real little and frail because she's been so sick. And long time ago, my mother used to smoke, and so did my father. But they hadn't smoked in 30 years. But she always kept a stupid blue ashtray. A big glass, heavy ashtray. And he gets mad, and he gets that ashtray, and he hits her off. <laughs> Head with this, now do you remember her name? It's Josephine. I can't believe you don't. He's getting ready to hit her again. Right, Dolly, right. You can't hit her. You can't hit her. She just got out of the hospital. What are you doing? But I mean, this was, they were like this. All of them were like that. My one aunt, they'd sit around this table in their house, my Uncle Justino's house. And their kitchen was huge, huge. And they had this big dining room table. And I mean, it was huge. And they'd all sit around this table. And then some of us would sit back. And this one aunt, every time she had something to say, she'd stand up. She'd push that chair back and she'd beat on that table. She'd pull the chair back, sit back down. She'd get back up. <laughs> you remember T. Diddy doing that? I did. She would do that. And, and they'd be arguing, but they weren't really arguing. It was just the way they talked. The way they talked. And it, it seems like they were yelling, but that's just the way they were. My husband puts it really well. We went down there for Christmas one year, and we got back, and he said, first of all, I didn't understand a word they were saying. They are all talking to you. I said, but do they all talk at the same time? <laughs> He said, not only did I have, have a problem with the language, but they all, how do they know what each other's <laughs> saying? And, and then they, uh, my, my aunts, instead of pulling these chairs out and hitting on the table and arguing, and, but they're not arguing. That's just the way they talk. And when we get together, we're the same way. And people go, why are you yelling? Why are you yelling? And so. It's it's family. It's good. It, my On this, that video or the DVD that we showed you earlier, there's a part on there where all the families are together at a Christmas party. And my grandmother puts on a show and stuff. Well, Christian had his friends over here, right? And he's a real nice kid. And he's... He's sitting there, Brian, and I look over at Brian, and he's bawling. And I'm thinking to myself, what the hell's he crying? He doesn't even know him. And 
I'm, and I said, Christian, Bryant's crying. Christian goes, why are you crying, Bryant? He says, look at the love. Look at the love in that family. Look at the love. I started laughing. I said, oh, you don't know that family. <laughs> well, I would like to thank you for your time this You're afternoon. You're more than welcome. And, and really sharing your lives with us. Uh, it, it's... It's, we really appreciate it. Well, we appreciate you coming and uh, doing this for the circus, like Dolly said. And if there's anything we can help you with, anything else you want to know, or uh, I don't know if you want to see some. I do. Yes. Mm -hmm.